Good evening, everyone. It's uh, just a little bit past 7, and we're going <coughs> to call the meeting to order. All right, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Can I have an acceptance of the agenda? Move to accept the agenda. Second. Moved by uh, Mr. Murray, second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Move on to item number three. Oh, no. Walk Let's finish number two first. Uh, the walk in period. Are there any walk ins here this evening? No walk ins. Seeing no hands, we'll move on to item number three, which is discussion of the uh, Situate Veterans Advisory Council bylaws. Mr. Kelly, you're the <coughs> spokesperson. Before you get started, I just want to take one quick second and just um, introduce or, or uh, announce that uh, Donald Knapp is in the back. Um, he was appointed our uh, uh, part-time Situate Veterans Agent, so thank you for coming in today. Um, right now, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I'm back to hear what you folks have to say about my proposal. Great. Um, we got all the literature. Um, we've all read it. I, I'll go through and see if anyone had any uh, any feedback on it. I think conceptually, I didn't have any issues, but uh, Rick, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Conceptually, no issues whatsoever. This is great. Thanks for doing it, all this sort of thing. Um, and uh, I, I'm ready, you know, to move to move ahead on this. A couple questions I just had sure. for you folks about some of the wording, and just <coughs> because we've seen a lot of these sorts of things, like on the Article Three membership, one, two, three, the fourth paragraph, it says, "The remaining members of the council shall be appointed by the board of selectmen. If the selectmen fail to appoint suitable members, the advisory council will assist in providing suitable candidates." I completely understand the spirit of what you're trying to do and I agree completely with the spirit but I could see how in the future people might wonder what the word suitable means and who who assesses suitability not this is not a comment anybody in right. this room with this board or your board but I'm thinking 20 years down the road when none well, of us are that's, here it's genuinely interested in, in bettering veterans uh, right we, we certainly <clears throat> don't want someone sitting on the council just to take up a seat certainly okay so, nor do we so, right yeah, so right. so that that's the spirit of that uh, yeah that, you know they're going to move forward they 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 want to anxiously be part of the council right uh you want to scratch those words out uh, but that's the spirit sure and, and i and i think it has to be a strong word like that because if this is a serious matter that we're dealing with yeah whether it's now or 20 years from now yeah these these candidates need to be suitable yeah not just to take a seat Sure. Nope, that's fine. I just wanted to okay. talk about it and just draw it to your attention. And if, if, the, if that was, because I don't know how much of this is, you know, frankly, boilerplate or how much of it is written or new and all that. So I just wanted to raise, just raise that point. Then the other thing in terms of the very next paragraph, and I'm not going to go through this paragraph by paragraph, sure. everybody. But, um, initially, the council will consist of four two year members and then five three year members, and then it's going to rotate through as people. As people, um, as the as you write, as the terms expire, all new members will be appointed for three years. Right. You might want to add in. Um, you might want to take one of those five three-year members, and make them, you know, initially, a one-year membership. Because if you if you do four at two years and five at three years, I still see you might have two big clumps forevermore. But there will be some people that won't fill out a term for one reason or another. They might move away or something like that. But when we initially populate commissions and panels, we usually will have at least one or two people on there for just one year. And sometimes what happens is people say, oh, you only put me on for one year. You must not like me. Well, the reality of it is they're on for one year. Then they go, then they're not on for a year. And then they get on for a three years. So they're on for four out of the three out of the first four years anyways. Right. right. Or they're on for four out of the first five years. Exactly. In that way, that might be something that you want to consider. So you, you you break it up a little more than just having those two groups. And um, that was it for me. And again, thank you all of you for for doing this and pushing this forward. Thank you. Okay. Uh, did you have the only observation? <coughs> I saw you had nine voting members. My, it's up to whatever you folks want to do. I just, from my experience, sometimes trying to get nine minimum of nine in some groups. Not necessarily this year, next year, but a few years down the road. It, it can be hard to get mem people to do it. So my, my only observation was is would seven be something you might think about because 
depending on you know the interest of people in, the in time and I'm not saying there's no interest in it but I'm saying it can wane so sure. just um, just a thought an well, the, the, the point that we were trying to make is to get it off the ground and get it off the ground real strong uh, I felt that nine folks would be a lot easier to manage than 15 most councils have 15 members as 15 in Hingham as an example uh, but some, something starting new like this something uh, kind of grassroots I think nine people are manageable. Uh, anything more than that, you, you're going to be all night I agree. going back I and forth. Yeah, and, I totally agree. And never getting anything done. I think we need to get things done quick, oh. at my, least moving in the right direction. My thought was lowering to like seven. In the future, you might <laughs> okay. think about getting smaller, you know, just to have a plus with a quorum, because if you get nine people and they're not there, and then you try. Just an observation. That's all I was saying. From my experience, going less than getting more, that's all. Can create more problems. No, it's good. I'm, I'm I'll, supportive of it. I'll just. <coughs> choke and then I'll support John on that um, I that stuck me out too I think you may want some phrasing there that says something like up to nine because if you if you put nine in hard code then all of a sudden you don't have five people at a meeting and it doesn't go and initially you're not gonna have an issue with that but like John said five years down the road so you just don't want to tie yourself into not being able to function because you don't have right nine members so I think further in the document it talks about what we consider a quorum. Right, yeah. but it, it's based on the nine. The quorum will always just be based on however many, many you have. A minimum of five members must be must represent right. a quorum. Yeah, right. So but if it was seven, then the minimum then it'd be four. It would give you. It, it, the reason is, Mr. it doesn't matter to me. We can change it later. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. can amend, you amend it. it. The thought was is that give it ten years or fifteen years, and you know, people sure. it might be. That's all. That's all. Again, I, I, I think we need to start somewhere, mm -hmm. and yeah. I feel that this is a comfortable somewhere, well, and, uh, you know, uh, the door is always open to make changes, because I made sure that that was yep, put in there, that. that if we need to make amendments to the original document, we can go ahead and do that, not a problem. Absolutely. Uh, so, again, I'm just circling back and, and saying that we're here tonight to, to move forward and, and get this accepted and, and actually have an official council here in situate. Did you have anything else? No, that was the only one. Sean, did you have any? Could you just explain just one thing on Article 2, your purpose, to serve as a liaison between the veterans and situate residents, as well as there was another one, uh, veterans in the different departments. That's overlapping what a veterans agent will do as well, right? Just kind of working hand in hand. That's if, exactly. If Donald's that's, not available, then. That's then, the spirit of it. Uh, to as an example to work with uh, the situate residents uh, that's actually happening right now um, uh, Ed Cavell visits the schools in in that outreach and, and <clears throat> sharing some uh, uh, about the American Legion to the to the school children so I, th I right. think that's, that's important uh, and that's going to continue and, and I'd like to see it continue on a larger scale at some point Raise awareness. Uh, that's great. So. I circled that one also, Sean. I think the wording of it, I, th I think it may be, liaison may be too formal of a word. You know, maybe it's interact with something like that, just so there's not this duty that you're the liaison, because really the liaison is the veterans agent. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think I agree with you on that on just but that one. But that's a great example yeah. of what, you know, right. Mr. Kelly just said. You know, I didn't think of that, you know, more. That's yeah. great. So maybe, I don't know if we can... Well, the, I mean, the, other, the other point is, it, as far as the liaison goes, it, it, yeah, use it as an, in another phrase. I mean, as a team, as a, a team right. partner. Uh, you know, um, uh, Mr. Knapp is, is new to the position. Um, I, bring, I personally bring to the table a, a tremendous resource for him, okay, and so doesn't the, the folks that are behind me. Oh, yeah. uh, so that's the spirit of that liaison piece, that we, we can go forward as, as, a, as, a, as a team. And not to work against each other. That's that's right. counterproductive. That's insane. Uh, so right. And, and if I may, Tony. Yeah. Um, it does say a liaison, not the liaison. Oh, that's a good and point. It's not capitalized. So it's it's a yeah. That's a good point. Okay. okay. And the other the other thing, obviously, H that I saw H is the most important. You know, the, the last one, the outreach to all of them, all of them find out, right. inform them of the, the benefits. So I was like, put that to 1A, because that's, you know, that's what you guys are trying to do. Um, the only other thing I'll mention, and not to expedite, but 
your penalties for missing meetings are very strict. <laughs> um, so, so you may want to well, You think don't have of, those penalties here? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so well, you may it's want unexcused. <laughs> That's what gets us off the hook. <laughs> So that, that paragraph I just read, and I'm like, oh, you know. Well, again, yeah. if, if we're aware that this person isn't yeah. coming, then that's fine. I mean, that's that's okay. We're cool with it. We're, you know, we're all adults. But, right. I mean, if this guy doesn't come and doesn't come and doesn't, well, we need these people because right. we, we don't have a large number. So he's telling us or she's telling us in a, in a quiet sort of a way, I'm all done. I don't want to do this. That's the right. way. That's the spirit I, of it. I have to say, when I looked at it, I initially took the same thought, but I have to thinking through it and some of the boards I've been associated with, I'd like to have that type of <laughs> association to sweep them off because if they're not showing up for two or three in a row, right. then they obviously have other commitments or other priorities or, or a lack of interest, some one of those three. So and I'm not into burning bridges. Right. Right. You know, so, I mean, that's a nice way to do it. It's in writing. Nobody, there's no yeah, misunderstandings, right. and yeah. everybody stays friends. Right. No. So those are just my thoughts from reading the document. Um, do we want to make any changes to this or do we want to just keep it as is I'm fine with it as is because it can always be amended if some of these things end up being yep. a significant issue I just wanted for at least my questions I just wanted to have a discussion okay do you want a motion if there's no other discussion sure um, move to accept the situate veterans advisory council bylaws as presented this evening second second by mr. Harris any further discussion great uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? None. It is unanimous, four to nothing. So at, at this point, now that we've uh, um, taken this action, you know, I'd like to formally put requests out there for anyone that would like to be on this council to um, submit applications. The application process will be just like any other board on the town. And uh, Kim, are you the, you'd yes. be the liaison for that. There's a form to fill out. Um, come in if you're interested. We've already gotten a couple, but, um, but give your applications to um, Kim, and then we'll review them and um, and uh, pick uh, uh, pick some worthy candidates. So. I, I understand there there are seven or eight uh, applications already. Yes. Um, have you haven't had an opportunity to review those? No. No. Correct. Okay. Not yet. Uh, two things uh, while we're here. Uh, one, I would like you folks to appoint me as chairman of the council. And number two, I'd like to know who I report to in the town. Would it be the selectman, our manager? I think typically what happens, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the group would have to be formed and they would pick pick a chairperson. Is that isn't that the way it usually works? The way we've done it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, so I think the next step is, and we don't want to slow the process down at all, um, but. If we get, if there's seven applications in now, we're announcing it now. If there's any press here, we'll ask them to put it in the paper. We have a meeting in two weeks. So that should give people that are very interested at least a week to get an application in here. And then maybe at the next meeting, um, we can get uh, get the board formed. Fair enough. Um, yeah. February 28th is a meeting. So we could. And we may have another one um, either that week also because of all the work that we have to get done. So, um, and that was no slight on you being chairman because I think you do a great job, but I just, I think it's really the group has got to get together and figure out, you know, who its players are and who's, you got to pick a vice chair, you got to pick a secretary, you got to pick a clerk, so all that will come in, the, in that uh, in that meeting. So that will be the next meeting? We, we At either, I, I don't know our agenda, but it, we're going to probably have two meetings that week, so either the 28th or the 1st. Okay. Probably the 1st. Probably the 1st. Um, so we will at our within two weeks we if we give people time to get their applications in give us some time to read it and um and get some feedback from um veterans agents and then we'll we'll try and formulate the committee okay thank you very much and then you're off and thank on. you and if, to answer your other question you will report to the board of selectmen because um, we appoint you so you will be you know reporting to us and of course the veterans agent sure. both in hingham and here will be you know part of that Fantastic. And we'll appoint a specific, a specific one of us to be your main contact on the board. <coughs> Great. So there will be a liaison that, that you 
you know, you keep on your email distribution list, you make sure him or her knows what's going on and that sort of thing. Excellent. Is that a capital L? That would be a capital L attorney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I speak on behalf of the whole board. We thank you for the initiative. We thank you for making it go so quickly and, um, you know, we look forward to the progress that you guys are going to make. So right. thank you all. We're excited about this. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, right. actually. Um, we'll move on to item number four, <coughs> which is the discussion vote of temporary wine malt beverages license by uh, Mass Bay Guides. Nice to see you, Bob. Thank you very much, sir. Always a great pleasure. Good to see you, Bob. Thank you very much. Bob, good you. Tony, great pleasure. Bob, see you. Have a good night. <clears throat> okay. We'll give Bob a second to. Good night. Oh, don't, <laughs> don't apologize. <laughs> okay. So here we are. Uh, Greg? Yes. If you can just say your name and your, your um, Greg address. Greg Sears from Mass Bay Guys. Yep. You're here. You want to have a, uh, a seminar, a fishing seminar? Yes, we have an annual fishing seminar every year. We've held it in Rockland the past uh, four years. And being a community thing that we're doing, you know, it's all the local fishing community people, Belson Bait, A to Z Marine, uh, some of the manufacturers, that the big wig manufacturers that come and display their product. The charter industry that I run in Situate Harbor. And uh, we're gonna be serving beer at lunchtime with hamburgers, hot dogs, and chowder. Great. Any questions from the board? So I just want to make sure I'm not texting here. I'm checking my calendar. So this is a for a Saturday night? Uh, this is all Four, day Saturday. March 3rd. Uh, starts at 8.30, but it ends at 6. But the uh, food and stuff will be probably like 11.30 to 2. Because, okay. Greg, the only thing somewhat humorous here, I think it's humorous, is the application says hours during which alcohol will be served, and you wrote 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I wrote the hours, you guys start the hours right. that we were going <laughs> to have. Uh, I don't think the alcohol. I think. Uh, but is there some have, town uh, law that says you can't? Or I mean, I, I think it's. It is kind of humorous, but I do want to make it? sure we're, we're accurate here. But, uh, again, I have a uh, silent chef doing the catering, and they're not yep. even showing up till like 11. So. Any other questions? Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Kim. Yes. I'll just right. say right now, so it'll be 11, 11. o'clock. Okay. Yeah, because this is a motion to grant the liquor license, so we need to change, change that, that time to 11. 11. All right. Just as much as I might come on down myself at 8, but you know what I mean. <laughs> 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 Little hair of the dog. Yeah, there you go. So. <laughs> Anything else for you? No, I'm, I'm all set. What's it going to be, like a trade show? Uh, it's sort of kind of. It's more of a cool. learning experience thing. Uh, like Pete's going to set up a uh, sales <coughs> area uh, from Belson State. Yep. A to Z will, I'm sure, too. Uh, but we, <coughs> we have manufacturers rep from like Shimano. We've got a Yanmar rep with an engine that's going to be taking an engine apart. We've got a uh, tuna guy from the uh, North Atlantic Trade who's going to bring a whole tuner and show guys how to prepare it and how they should set it up for market. Cool. Open to the anyone in the public? Greg? No, it's actually private. Uh, ticket sales are sold out, but uh, you know I can get tickets for anybody up here if they'd like. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds that sounds neat. That yeah, it's actually become really very things. popular. We have to uh, we sell out a month before. Really and, good. Know, it's become very popular. Great. And let's for the record let it know that we'd be happy to buy a ticket if we <laughs> <laughs> at, at full ticket. price. At full price. <laughs> <laughs> But it sounds very interesting, and yeah. and uh, yeah, no, it'll be a good thing, and hopefully I'll be doing it annually in town. Uh, I will have to say that the venue could use a little work if the town uh, really wanted people to use it more. I mean, I, I'm going to make do with what's there, but you know, the bathroom facilities, uh, the water supply for the uh, caterer, you know, just things like that. Uh, there's no telephone service or internet service in the building. 
Uh, and it would make a, a great building for, a, uh, you know, you're calling it the community center building, uh, but it it make a great meeting type place for things like what I'm doing here. But it's a little bit on the uh, underrun side. But we're all fishermen. We're used to living in a bunch of slop anyway. You know? <laughs> no, but this is the first time I've heard this. You know, I don't know about you guys. So it's just you know, give it a little time. And I think you know, if you wait, you know two or three meetings we'll be wrapping all that up so I think you're just a little bit ahead of the curve we're yeah, yeah well I happen to like yeah. a motion mr. chair please uh, move the board of selectmen vote to grant a temporary wine and malt beverages license to Mass Bay guides Greg Sears for a fishing seminar to be held at the Harbor Community Building on Saturday March 3rd 2012 from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. wine and malt beverages may be served inside inside the building only liquor liability insurance certificate to be provided by the silent chef caterer second Second by Mr. Danny. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good luck. Thank you, gentlemen. See you, Greg. Good luck. Move on to item number five. This is a, another discuss for the St. Patrick's Day Parade special permit for a parade and a discussion on a wine and malt beverage license. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I'm Christine Walsh. I'm on the parade committee. Um, I've been on the parade committee many years. In fact, um, it started in my old neighborhood when I was a kid. So um, hopefully I'll be able to answer all your questions as Eddie could not be here tonight. Okay. Okay. Great. Do you want to, uh, well, we can start it. Why don't we start with the first piece of it, which is just the parade, the special permit for the parade itself. Um, We've gotten feedback from the police. You know, obviously this is a big event in town. Um, we get a, a lot of turnout from both in town and out of town. Jamie, can you try to close that? Um, thanks. Just gonna go close it. Um, you've, you've got feedback from the police and the fire, DPW, um, and all that sort of stuff, which is documented yes. in here. Yes, um, we expect it to be a mirror almost exactly last year's parades right. in size. Um, you know, the, our police coverage, um, et cetera, et cetera. We've got, you know, we've all been doing this for many years, so we've got it down pretty, you know, got it down pat. So it should mirror last year's almost exactly. Okay. I'll let them talk. Uh, do you have any? I had asked Christine earlier before the meeting started if the size of it, you know, did she expect it to, you know, grow by 50% smaller? She said the same. So that was my concern, mm -hmm. the amount of uh, bands and participants right. in no, the parade. It should be the same size. You know, we're still, we still have a tight budget um, given the economy, so uh, we're going to keep it, this, we plan on keeping it the same size this year. Rick, any? Oh, it's, no, it's, it's great. The only thing I'd ask is every year after the parade, we get, Kim gets, lots of emails about people complaining about parking tickets. Okay. So somehow we've got to get it out to people where they can and can't park. They have to know that if you park where it says no parking, you're going to get a ticket. And that, you know, there's so many people in a small area over the course of that parade that for safety reasons, we really have to enforce those rules as strictly as you can. We know you have, you know, shuttles that are gonna go back and forth from the MBTA parking lots, which is great, but. I think it's difficult because it's mostly out of towners. Right. And, you know, everyone that's in town knows how it works. Um, you know, we've, we've got everything in the Situate Mariner. Eddie's been on, on um, uh, what's the radio station there? The BTD. BTD. Um, so I, I'm not sure you can completely avoid that, mm -hmm. but we, we, we try. I think most of it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kim, is right on, right across from the church, right. you know, yes. right on New Kent Street. Yeah. So maybe you get some extra signs that say something like, you will be ticketed if you park here. Right. You know, plan on it. Sure. Because it will happen, okay. um, and you know that's really the biggest complaint that I hear yeah. about this. That's a good point. I couldn't agree more with what Tony, but I get a little suggestion for you. A friend of mine told me and uh, suggested it: take the sawhorses like Al has put by the windmill, and put sawhorses down. Then people really will, will understand okay. that they'll see it. That's. I don't think that'll be a problem. We have a pretty good crew that morning. That right. This does all of that. But if, you, a, if you've seen the emails, of, you know, people will write to us, I'm never coming back to your town we've again. Seen that, the that's letters. Just, yeah, that just stinks, you know. Right. But it's also situated locals, too, because they're used to parking there on Sundays. Exactly. Right? Even though it says no parking. Right. 
and I, you know, I park here for religious services, but I can't go to the parade. Right. Okay. So why don't we uh, and then have a motion yeah, on the Then we get, well, whatever. <laughs> so how about a motion for number one? Move the board of second vote to support the Citroen Chamber of Commerce St. Patrick's Day Parade Special Events Permit for Sunday, March 18th, 2012, stepping off from the Gates School at 1 p.m., proceeding down First Parish Road, taking a left on Front Street, taking a right on a Jericho Road to the boat ramp parking lot and parole conditions set by the town administrator, fire, police, DPW, building, and health department. Second. Second by Mr. Murray. All in favor? Aye. 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 So it is unanimous, 3 nothing. Um, move on to discussion on item number two, which is the request for a uh, temporary wine and malt beverage license at the uh, uh, for the Situate Chamber of Commerce at the um, community building, uh, whatever we're calling it now, the old Pier 44. Right. Um, and that would be after the parade from 3, thir from three to 7 p.m. Right. <coughs> Any discussion <clears throat> on this? I, again, I talked to Christine a couple of minutes before the meeting started. Um, initially, I didn't think it was a great idea um, because I didn't think that well I had asked Christine who was going to be going to this event is it open to the public you know where would those people go if Pier 44 was unavailable you know are we taking business from the restaurant you know from the restaurants and, and, and I don't believe so um, because we, we have a function every year after the uh, after the parade. The past few years, it, the venue's been supplied by one of the committee members. Right. Um, every couple of years, um, we try to get a venue, like we, we actually had one at the Pier 44 before it became the community building, um, in which we invited all of the chamber members, some of the, um, the sponsors and the dignitaries of the town, um, that particular year we had a band in from Ireland that actually played at the Pier 44. It's, it's a private function. It's just for the people that, you know, I just named. It's a family event. Um, you know, so this isn't anything that I think that maybe people may perceive that it is. And we do it every year in a smaller setting. But this year we would like to be able to have one of the bands play and in the venue that we've been having it in, um, which is, is not a restaurant, a local restaurant, um, so those people wouldn't be there anyways. Um, you know, it's just not large enough for us to have a band play. Are you aware that we asked the restaurants not to serve alcohol during the parade? This will be after the no, parade. No, I know that, I know that. Yes. But during, during the parade, we ask, you know, establishments not to serve or yes. sell it, so you know, if, if you were open to the public, let's say anyone could come in, now you're, you know, competing directly. It's a town-owned building and you're competing with a, right. you know, the private businesses. Um, if I vote for it, it is, you know, it's, it's just going to be a trial thing as far as Probably I'm concerned. Probably less than I, 100 people, you know, so we're not taking, I don't think any, you know, those places are packed. They must have a fantastic day on on St. Patrick's Day because of the parade, the food, the alcohol. Um, what controls do you have in place to stop people from the public just coming in? We'll have just one door open. Right. Um, we'll have at least one or two people at the door and we'll have a list. Um, we haven't sent out any invitations yet because we wanted to you know, obviously get the approval first, but we'll have a list of who has been invited, <coughs> RSVP'd, um, I assume just that one door will be open. The other door to the old bar won't be open. Um, you know, we have functions throughout, you know, uh, up until the parade at, at the Barker. We have the Mad Hatters on, on March 3rd. Mm -hmm. We always have somebody there taking a ticket or, or um, usually we have about two people at least um, to make sure that who's getting in is who should really be there. Just wouldn't want to see um, that. Did you say you were going to have a band? We may. That's, I don't think, permissible at the. Oh, okay. Well, I guess a, we won't. It's the first then. we've <laughs> heard of it. 
and it and I don't think we've granted any music there in respect for the neighbors. Okay. All right. Well, we won't have a band then. <laughs> um. <coughs> you, yeah, Christine, I'm not too enamored of this application, to be honest with you. But I was starting to come around a little bit until you said we're probably going to have less than 100 people. And use of the word probably, <coughs> and then the number 100, when you said a small private function for you know people to gather afterwards with their families, I was thinking like 20, it could 30 be 30, people. 30, we just don't know. I, I yeah. understand, ex and, I, and I absolutely appreciate your candor and your honesty. <coughs> I think you're right, you don't know, and that's what worries me um, in this location. Um, so, uh, you know, I was thinking 20, 25 people for all you folks that have worked so hard and put it on together. And I know there's a lot of people that have done that, but still. And then you, you, you answered honestly, and like right now, you just again did honestly, which again I appreciate. We're just going to have to agree to disagree on this one. Um, you said, you know, uh, well, like I said, you, you, you said probably less than 100, then you said you don't know. So I could I could see it going south in a hurry, well, with particularly with its very public location, and the fact that people are used to that location being very accessible. Um, so that's that's a big concern of mine. And also, just on top of it, that's where the parade ends. So every single person that's in the parade is going to be in front of that building, and if there's a party there, then you know, people are going to partake. I mean, that's that's my concern. I think Sean was touching on it. You know, it's re it's really our intention not to make this parade any sort of an alcohol-related event. You know, it's, that's why we ask all the establishments not to serve during the parade. And, you know, the conflict comes with, okay, now we want to use a public building at a very popular site that's going to have a ton of traffic that really is not... Um, understood in terms of the, the, the size of it um, serving alcohol and that's where where the concern I think for all of us are um, we understand <coughs> you want to do it there we understand you know you're right to do it there it's just uh, it's a concern of ours it's a concern of the police chief he's written us a letter saying that he doesn't really support that um, his other uh, there's no entertainment license those for a bit. He's concerned about parking um, and then the, the ability to control the public and the public's access, access to that is all a concern of all of ours. And we just, I'm getting the sense here from the three of us that it's probably not, the risk is probably high, uh, risk is probably the wrong word, but, um, you know, it's just not perhaps the best place for a town building to be serving alcohol at the end of the St. Patrick's Day Parade? I think. Um, I don't know. The, the memo does come from the chief who raised a bunch of issues, and so it's very hard for me to overrule the police chief on something like this. What if we have a detail at the front door? Um, Would that make you feel more comfortable? Do we do that? Yeah, they do. No, they won't. But they're licensed liabilities, too. Yeah. So um, I don't know if, well, I would not support this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we have a, a motion not to support or it's just withdrawn or what do we do? Or if we don't have a motion, then it doesn't occur. It doesn't occur? Um, or, well, which I'd much I, rather not have a motion. If I made the motion, it doesn't look like we had the votes. And it was going to be a trial thing only. Right. So, I, you know, and, you know, it was real, as you could tell, it was real comfortable with the idea, but I just want to look at it for yeah. one year. Yeah. I just, yeah. it makes me nervous. Like you said, the parade ends there, and the the, uh, <coughs> the risk or the um, liability of, of just a lot of people entering the building is, is pretty high. It could be hard to control. If it was at another location, different. Doesn't sound like I have the vote, so I'm not going to make a motion. So at this point, we move number one for the parade permit, but not the liquor um, at the building. Kim, procedurally, is that okay? I believe so. Okay. Sure. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ben. Thanks, Christine. Okay, moving on to item number six. Can we get oh, actually um, six? We we need to get Mr. Danahy back. Oh yeah. Can someone give a yodel, please? So number six actually has been postponed. Save it for a, a later time, Tony. Well, we'll see. I know we've got. Uh, All right. No, for another meeting, should we put it? The back it depends. What All right. Town okay. Council, uh, All right. Comes back with. Um, number seven is a discussion on award contract food and beverage operations at Widow's Walk. Jamie? So number six is postponed. Hi, Jamie. I guess that's quite a large cup of coffee you got there, Jamie, at this hour of night. <laughs> Stop swearing him in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but, well, obviously you've uh, you've been running the establishment for how many years is it now? Eight years. Eight years yeah. now, and uh, the contract came up, and there were um, Trisha, tell me how far I can go. Are two applicants? Yes, you can. Okay. Yep. So two applicants came in. We looked at them. Uh, we deemed that one of the ap applicants was incomplete, so it was unresponsive. Um, has no indication as to whether they would have not got <coughs> it, but that just left it to you, okay. and uh, your. Um, contract has been or is going to be before us to see if we want to accept that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> personally, I've been in there a number of times over the last eight years, and I think you do a great job there. Um, I've heard a lot of compliments for your work there, and uh, um, I know you want to do it, and I know you want to continue to grow it. So, um, you know, I, I, I would recommend you, and I think you do a good job. So, Thank you very much. Um, I'll pass along to the rest of the comments and. I'm delighted to see you applied. I'm delighted to see you won. I hope you're delighted to move this forward, and I'll be delighted to continue coming down. Sean, any? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I too. They they said it better than I can say it, Jamie. You've done a great job. I too have been in there um, many times, and I know you put a lot of effort into it. That shows a yeah. lot of recommendations. I read them earlier tonight. Um, and sometimes it's it's tough dealing in a, in a facility like that. A lot of people coming through the door, and uh, keep, keep up the good work. Thank you very much, guys. Um, so, we expect the golf course to have more players. So we expect you to have. I hope so. More uh, more customers as well. So do I have a motion? Will the board of selectmen vote to award the bid for Widow's Walk Food and Beverage to Jamie Miller, 27 Beach Plum Lane, at the contract price of forty-five thousand dollars for year one. 48,150 for year two, 49,500 for year three, with the option in years four and five to renew at the sole discretion of the town and further that all terms and requirements of this lease are met as outlined in the invitation for bid issued by the town. Second. Second by Mr. Danny. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jamie. Moving on to item number eight, um, which is uh, the MAPC grant application support letter. Town planner, Laura. Laura, how are you? Fine, fine, thanks. How are, how are all of you tonight? We're doing well. Good. Um, so th you're here before us. This is uh, an application for a grant um, to do a, an analysis, a market study analysis on the town. This is a project that um, I'm not sure what department it's in now. Did we move it from planning to selectman's um, budget? Or not we, yet. You not yet. Well, you haven't come back to finalizing yeah. stuff like that yet. So there was a portion of this that you put before us <coughs> in one of those two budgets, and now you're applying for a grant um, to do to to pay for a portion of this as well. Right. And I assume that's what you're here to talk to us about. Right. Um, I know we all read the material, so you don't have to go into a ton of detail and what the application is, I don't think, unless the board has has questions on it. So you want to give us a synopsis and tell us what Okay, I'll just give you a real yeah. quick synopsis. The um, Economic Development Committee started out wanting to do a market study. They wanted to bring in some items into that besides just retail, um, retail activities. So they brought into it, um, they wanted to bring into it office and industry and um, mixed use as well. The Metropolitan, Anning, Metropolitan um, Area Planning Council had 
funding available not to hire an independent consultant, but for their own people to do this kind of work. And they'd probably farm out some of this, but um, they would do some of the work themselves. So that's what this application is for. Um, it is for $30,000, and there would need to be some money from the town that would supplement it. Um, you know, approximately 10000 It might be a few hundred dollars less, but that's basically what it would be. Um, so this piece <coughs> is, is the piece um, that consists of the application to MAPC. And um, for it really to go anywhere, um, the thing that, that it you know, really needs from the town is, is a letter of support from, from you all. So have you filed the application for the grant? No, I'm really waiting to see. Okay. Um, so as soon as we give you the support, then you can file the application. And are we, what's the probability that we'll get it? Or will we get it? Um, I'm hoping that, that we will get it. They have been working pretty closely with me on it. Um, hopefully we'll get the whole thing. If we don't, we'll have to regroup and see what, you know, what we do next. But I, I think there's a very good chance that we'll at least get you know, some substantial amount of money out of it. <coughs> okay. We um, typically haven't used MAPC, so when the EDC came in and asked for the money, I asked Laura to contact MAPC worked really hard in defining the scope I think with the EDC and adding a couple of other things but since historically we haven't utilized a lot of their services I think the chances that we'll get this are very very high good no I I, I heard the same that we talked about at the EDC at the last meeting and uh, strongly would um, supportive of it and I think it's a great opportunity for the town to have um, the MAPC undertake the task of looking at the basically the two additional issues. They're looking at retail, the office type of space potential, and, and industrial I don't think really is what we're looking at, but at least to look at that other option to say what could, what could benefit the town if we go this direction instead of um, um, if we don't. But the point is that this is going to be, if we get it, you know, $30,000 that we don't have to pay that we get. You know, for other, uh, the, the state ultimately is going to be paying through their grants that the MAPC gets. So. It's a good. It's a good opportunity. So, I'm supportive of it. And just, to, you know, just to add to what John said, the things that they're going to do demographic analysis. They're going to measure demand um, per square footage for renovated space and identify trends and growth patterns and and really take a look at the town and see where we can build our commercial base, what areas of town, what types of businesses, what size of buildings, that sort of stuff. So it'll be. This is really what the Economic Development Committee's one of their tasks is and one of their initiatives and one of the things that they really want to follow up on is defining where in town can we develop and what's the chance of success is what I, I got from what they're going to come in and do. And obviously they're experts at this. So, um, so, so that's where we'll, it is. Will they be looking at um, town-owned land and as well as private property that, you know, there might be large private holdings that would be available and things like that? Um, I don't know specifically, but I imagine they're going to look more at areas than actual pieces of property. Okay. All right. Um, you know, on the driftway, in North Situate, in the village yeah. of Beaumont. Sean, any? The only, you know, one thing that stuck out is if we do get this grant, I guess I'm a little, it, it will take about seven to eight um, months to actually do the whole project. Um, they keep mentioning town staff in here in terms of the people they're going to report to and the people they're going to present the findings to. And I just want to make sure that that's really us, you know, that we're in that town staff forum. And I think it's just logistics in terms of the words that they're using. Um, but obviously get us in the loop in terms of, of um, you know, getting the, the information and being updated on it. Um, is this, this part of the document defining the strategy? Is this our document to them? That's our document yes. to them. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the one thing that st stuck out to me is that the commitment of the town planner to 50 to 75 hours on this project. Does the, the town planner have 50 to 75 hours to put into this project? <coughs> well, sort of stretched out over. Over eight know, months, you can. Over eight months, yeah. Um, okay. Hoping you say absolutely, I have the time. <laughs> I think it's great for the town. You know, this is the information that we need to find out where we're going to develop and where we're going to, you know, potentially expand our tax base. Mr. Actually, Warren. you raised that point. 
who do they report to? They report to you? I think I'll be the contact person, but they're really going to be reporting. I, well, I don't know if reporting is the word I would use. I think they're going to be working close with, with the Economic Development Committee. I think they'll be having a couple of meetings with them. But you know, certainly, I think the, the EDC would be very, very happy if, if you all wanted to come to that, or if you wanted to make it so they just come in here and report to the selectmen. I think that would that would be fine too. I mean, however, it should be set up. I mean, I think because the Economic Development Committee was set up to, to deal with economic development issues, I, I thought that they would be the ones most involved. So. Okay. Yeah. I did just keep us and the planning board in the loop. I mean, because those are obviously initiatives that we've been all working on. You know, so if you can make all three of us listed as those kind of liaison people. I don't know that we can make all the meetings or, or that stuff, but if we get CC'd on the information and stuff, that'd be good. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm not worried about the planning board being in the loop because they're intrinsically going to be in the loop, but I want to make sure we're in the loop as well. Okay. No, I, I think you can probably write that in that there's some update meetings with the board at various phases or um, benchmarks. I don't think that will be a problem. So at this point, we don't need a, a motion, but you just want us to sign this letter? Well, I think they're looking for um, for your support. So if you want to sign a letter, that's fine. If you want to make a motion that you support it, you know, should have a vote. Okay. Yeah. So can someone make up a motion? Sure. Move to uh, support um, I don't know, do you want to, is it a letter or is it, I was going to say application, application uh, for the Situate Economic Development Study to the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Second. Second by Mr. Murray. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Laura? Thanks, Laura, for all your work on this. Okay, moving on to item number nine. Um, and that is. Um, <coughs> oh, so nine. I'm sorry, am I getting. No, nine's next. Where's the demolition one? Is that later? That's uh, under annual town meeting article. It's at the bottom of nine. It's at the bottom of nine. Okay. So item number nine um, is uh, review of fiscal year 13 budgets and articles. And the first one on the agenda is, as you can tell by the movement in the crowd, the school department. Jim, how are you? I'm well, Tony. Thanks for having us. Bill, how are you? Good. Good. I must say, before we get started, um, although I am somewhat familiar with it, we just got this an hour or so, two, a couple hours ago, so I don't know if everyone's had a chance really to scour through it too much. So we may have to walk through some of this stuff um, to get us up to speed. Um, where do you want to start? I guess, I guess the first place I can start is that we are, um, in terms of, I know there's some confusion in terms of what is the, what is the number that you know, essentially the, the school is given a number from, from the town in terms of what the budget's going to be. It comes from the town administrator and from the forecasting. Um, we've been working on that over the last several days. There's a forecasting meeting tomorrow. Um, it looks like the number that is going to be coming to the school is about $30,100,000 in that range. I know that, the, I know Mike, Bill, and I saw Jamie a little while out there, you know, we have that meeting tomorrow night. If you come to it, that's where we'll hammer it down. And that'll probably be the last meeting before we, you know, that any input would go into this. But that's within tens of thousands of dollars of what that number is going to be. Um, so Tony, that'll, yes. Question for you. Looking at this, just this piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Does that replace the 29294? Does that replace the 3239? I.e., does that include those other my take on this is that the their budget right now is at thirty two thirty nine and, and that's the number that they're gonna be given is thirty one because there's about a hundred thousand dollar delta right one. now. I just want to know which number take. to which you were referring. Right. right. All right. Thanks. So this is their number. this is what the school is saying that they need to operate and as every year they get well, a it's number. It's a number that we you know, to be honest with you, it's a number that we got from forecasting and then we ran we got an email from Trisha with their adjustments, and I ran them through the, through the fore last forecasting number on December 6th. The That's budget the number. number for FY13 was sent to school December 26th. Yeah, and on December 27th, I sent it to Tony, and I said I did not agree with the number because forecasting did not come up with this number. I, and that was 
it's two hundred thirty thousand. I think, it's, I, I think it's not worth productive it to get into that discussion of that debate right now. At this, right. at the but last that number there, all right. The, the number that is going to be coming out, at, which will be the budget number, is about that number that I said. It's been, uh, you know, there's a process to getting it. The forecast moves every day. We get new numbers that adjust it one way or the other. Um, there's been discussions about where we're going to be moving in different directions in terms of capital. Those have been discussed over the last couple of days and been resolved. And the number is what the number is, and it's going to be around that thirty million one hundred thousand dollars. So, regardless of the road it took us to get there, that's where we where we are. Um, so, if you want to run through this, um, and we can see what what the components are and ask any questions on the detail, and then we'll um, you know deal with whatever. Okay. So our base budget last year. So our coming out of which really is our. FY budget is the 29294213. It's the top number there. Mm -hmm. Based on the number that I calculated, we got a one, $1, million, $1 increase or 4% from, from the, the override. Oh, no. From this year increase. From this year's increase, right? From the forecasting calculation. But then the beach sticker number that we got last year was one time, so that goes away. And then uh, the Gates legacy money that we got last year was a one time payment also, so that goes away. So that's how we came up with a 3239. One hundred sixty thousand dollar number. Right, and then your base budget. So if you come down to our base budget now, if you pull it all the way back down there, and then you add up all the, the these are all the major changes that come out of the nineteen pages that are in the back behind this. So overall, our step column, all those increases for this year was uh, the seven hundred sixty thousand dollars, or two point six percent. Bill, one quick step back. So the twenty nine two ninety four is all of the same? It's really our 11 budget. I'm just, go, these are all the ups oh, and I downs. I got you. So it's the same numbers up right. there. So. Usually we end up with a big gap here, and I usually, sh then the next page we right. really solve the gap, but there's right. no gap. Right. So I just use the same form. So this is same number of employees. So these are all the major changes to our budget this year, summarized on one page. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me the, 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 the direction of the beach? So the beach sticker money and the Gates legacy money was one year money. So that was helped fund you last year. You don't have it this year, so you have to take that up. Gotcha. Right. Fine. So again, I'm just trying to yep, got walk us through how mm -hmm. we got to Understood. the numbers. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. So then, so get to, so the first increase on here is the step increase in column changes, all the things that happen um, across all the, not only the SDA, but all the unions in, in the school system. Uh, then the SDA furlough you know, we had a furlough last year, so that expense comes back on our books this year. So that's another two hundred twenty-two thousand dollars we get a fund. They also gave there was a tuition relief last year of seventy-five thousand that comes back on the books this year. We need to fund it. it wasn't in the budget last year. We do have two new positions uh, in the area related to our technology budget at one hundred five thousand. The federal jobs bills goes away. So when you look at the FT analysis, the mid all everything except for the tech positions were job were positions that were paid off the jobs bill last year. So those, to assume those costs now, they, now they're coming back on right. our books. Uh, sped all placement, this is a change in uh, two children um, graduated out of the program this year, so it's a good first this year. Um, contracted services are a bunch of miscellaneous things for Jim that we reduced. Utilities uh, was a reduction of some work that we had done in electrical uh, we had an electrical contractor come in for them, came in and put in, you know, the switches and all that stuff over uh, the school. So was, all the new ballots were changed out. So we had to pay for it over three years, and then it came off this year. Um, curriculum, we reduced by 37000 and then our capital budget, we reduced by 198000 So this is our capital that we spend on internal to the school, computers, all that stuff. So that's kind of like the high-level analysis of all the major changes in the school. Right. So, in the in the base budget, though, were there one-time expenses as well that are going to be not incurred? One hundred ninety-eight thousand dollars of capital, thirty-seven thousand dollars of. Those are the only one-time expenses that aren't in the base budget. Will not be incurred next year. Right. Okay. So we have additional. Those were in last year's. We put more. We have, you, when you see, 
we have the one time money that we're going to spend next year. We're not, we could, we have, we reduced that amount to make the budget this year. Uh, we, we have more money in one time that we've not committed to operating salaries because we're not sure of the out years. So we still have that one time money that we haven't right. committed to core operating that can be pulled back. So we could curriculums down to 300,000, you know, next year, depending on how it happens, we could pull that down to 200. So again, we're trying to hold, hold as much as we can here. So I talked to Tony, the forecasting is the numbers is much more important for the out years than it is for this year because we need to be able to plan. We need to be able to say, you know, it, when you look at the FTEs, we're still down 30 positions at the school in the school since 2009. So we're trying to figure out: do we add one more person? Do we not add one person? So the difference between the numbers that we got from the town, my number, your number, we got to go back and say, okay, maybe we can add another position, or maybe we can't. You know, depending on, you know, how we feel in, in the out years. Okay. So, I mean, the next page is really trending. You know, how, where do we spend our money? You know, you can see almost all the increases are in personal services. And that's really related to all the increases, the jobs bill, all the things I just went over. So we put a $1.4 million dollar increase in personnel and then a $500,000 reduction in all our other lines across the school. So this is a lot of the one-time stuff, Tony, you know, where if we didn't get that electrical relief, we would have cut a little bit more curriculum or cut a little lower capital. So we had some positive things. We didn't have that $200,000 credit from the SPED bill. We would have had a cut, you know, another $200,000 somewhere else. Right. But that same SPED bill or credit of $200,000 this year could be a $200,000 increase next year. Rick, so just so I'm following these numbers, so roughly personnel services in, in your proposed budget here on page two, and I don't know if this is going to go up or down or whatever, but just using this number. That's $25 million basically. And the overall amount is 29 so well, that's about, okay. right, yeah, 30 but whatever. $25 million out of $30 million is personnel. Yep. Okay. I just, that is a very important thing for the public to just be aware of because you can talk about this and a curriculum and you can talk about this other improvement and that other improvement which are all important and some are going to win and some are going to lose but 25 million out of 30 million plus or minus either way is personnel so down here there's or percentages right yeah that's 83 percent in my head in my i did a rough calculation it's ri also written down oh it is oh that would be helpful. how close was i 82 and a half not bad yeah <laughs> not bad yeah, you read it <laughs> yeah so um, those are uh, you know Bill, can we take one step back for one second? On the front page, it says contractual increases at zero. Yeah, so we have zero in there right now. So you have zero in there right now. That's that's still in the process. That hasn't been. We're up for negotiations for 13. Right. So right now, the contract ended in 12. Ends in 12, yeah. Ends this current year that June. we're in. Yeah. And then we've got to negotiate an, a contract after that, and we, we have this in at zero, that's which. Right. If we go back to the override conversation that we had, that was the assumption, and just to bring everyone up to speed, that override had a three-year three -year window was the realistic window that we were looking at. And as Bill just alluded to, year one, there was a little bit of money to put into things like capital and infrastructure and this sort of stuff. In year two, there was, it was that was kind of the break-even year where all those one-time expenses went away. And then year three, there was a little bit of a shortfall, and we were hoping to save some from year one and two to, to fill the gap in three. Right. So that was the window of the override, um, as as I remember it. So, and all those had this contractual number at zero percent in it. Great. Okay. So that's kind of the summary. If you go to the next page, it's just uh, the review by schools and where, you know where, where were the direct expenses charged. Uh, admin has we have centralized a lot of things under admin over the years. And SPED is actually uh, also in the admin budget, the administration for SPED. But more importantly is the enrollment. You can see that you know our enrollment has been pretty flat over the years. I think we're down we're down about one percent this year. But if you look over the years, it's since it was three thousand two hundred twenty five in two thousand eight, and it's three thousand two hundred twenty four now. Uh, we have seen a reduction in elementary schools, so right now we're feeling that more. The big we lost a couple of really big grades coming out of uh, Jenkins that moved up to Gates and ultimately moved up to freshman year in high school. So we've seen some 
so that has been our challenge, I would say. You know, we're, we've seen some reductions in the elementary school, we've been able to manage with that, but the growth at uh, the Gates and uh, high school has been a challenge, especially when we're laying off teachers. Uh, the expense per pupil down the bottom, I think it's, it's not a really a good number, but we present it, you know, kind of overall, you know, uh, you, you can, you know, the cheap, you know, the less, most least expensive school is, is Jenkins. You know, it's, it's a school that has the most students in it, you know, related to, you know. Really? That's a personnel, you know. So it's really, you know, you have one principal for 600 people. It costs a little less for that one person, divided by six, you know, 600, so, and, but that's the, those are the numbers. So overall, we're spending an average of direct cost of about nine thousand three hundred seventy-nine dollars per student. Um, the next page is our FTE analysis. So this is something you know we really worked with Bob uh, DiLorenzo on last year in an advisory. Kind of wanted to see a trending out of our FTEs and bucket them in a, uh, in a kind of way like this to tell our story. So I think it was a lot of work, but uh, I think it really helped. Uh, so you can see here, it's you know budget goes across to twelve. And then the adjustments are in the next column. So last year in this adjustment column, there was probably 20, another reduction of 20 positions. This year, the seven that are on the top professional line, uh, that brings, those are the seven jobs coming back that were paid off the jobs bill last year. So they were here, we're not higher than new positions, they were just charged directly to the jobs bill grant. And the two below are our two new tech. Where did you said 20 reduction? Where's last that? year, last year when we were presenting this, there was like 20 redu reduction. So it's not. Oh, okay, gotcha. And then if you look down the bot, if you go all the way over to the right, uh, since 09, we are still down. To, if you exclude kindergarten because we added full day K, which is a fee for service program, we're down 29.8 positions. Still. Where's that bill? far right column the gray, in the gray, shaded shaded oh gray. all right okay down below so again if you just still look where we are at we're, we're we're down 30 positions since since it's 09 but if i'm reading that chart right <clears throat> you say total excluding k does that include administ everything above that so that includes admin and professional everything. or is everything it, right everything so admins down 6.4 percent professionals down 3.8 eight sped is down 13.9 so, ah, gotcha. there's, there's nine new positions in this budget, seven which are not really new positions, this is have to be funded through the budget as opposed to through the grant. Two new positions are the only two new slots in the budget. Correct. Uh, assuming that anyone that retired or left is just being replaced. Right. Now, there, I know there's a little bit of you know what? I won't go there now. I'm and I'm sorry, Tony, okay. and and Bill. So that 29.8. What's the baseline? Is that baseline against 09? Yep. 09. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Let's change this for one. Change for one. Yep. And that's through your proposed through 2013. After those new positions are in there. Are Can I see just? I don't know if you know this number off the top of your head, but it's just rough. This is back to 09. Right. I'm just going to make a number up. Go five years back before that to 2004, 2005. Is it like, does that, does that minus 29.8? Does it go to like minus 50? Or does it go to zero? Or do you know what, even what direction it goes roughly? Is it bouncing around all about the same level? Or, well, uh, and, and I'm not asking for a detailed itemization, but you know what I mean. I'm just trying to get the little, the tapestry here. It did go up um, after the 2007 full. <coughs> Right, but I specifically asked before that, for that exact the, purpose, so I'm with you. But before 2007, we added staff after the 2007 override. Yeah. Uh, so that the staff was obviously less before, prior to 2007. Right. Um, uh, the, the 2009 levels, because what we uh, had got to that point after the 2007 override. Yeah, okay. So Seven, it was less. Yeah. Less okay. than, and probably less than it is now. Yeah. No, that's fine. That's that's. Right. Um, one last question in in on this page for me. Thanks, Mike. Um, 2012. There's an increase from 2011. Is that because the override 
Yeah. Part of the override money was used to restore positions that were eliminated. Yeah, actually on the next page I reconciled. Okay. And the next page. So the, the, the first four and a half positions were in the override. Uh, it depends how you look at the other one. But we had five major retirements last year. So that really helped us out. Be able to, someone coming off an M45, we're able to hire a B1 and a B2. It's almost half. So changes in that budget. The furlough, a circuit breaker, and then the utilities reduction last year gave us some room in the budget to hire someone really to mitigate the gates issue that we're having. But we had th up to th uh, three studies a day per student, and we had high 30s at the high school for uh, freshman English and some of those other things. So we had some major challenges because these big classes were coming up to gates and big classes going into uh, the high school. So. so, but that was also funded through through the override, right, in 12? That was our proposal to fund it, you know, so when we, we originally we, we proposed, that was in our original proposal right. to fund it, but then when the override get cut, we had to pull back, because we had, we had to hold back uh, until we could make a decision that we had enough money to put it, right. to hire those positions. So even with hiring? Well, if you say five are really a wash, they're just five left, able to hire 10. You know, that's really the retirement. That was a major retirement year we had last year. Uh, we usually don't see five big retirements happen in one year. So when those five retired, did you hire eight? All right, almost, we almost had 10 we were able okay, to hire. So you're right. okay. It's literally almost that big of a difference. Okay. And then down the bottom, it just gives you the seven that were came from the uh, jobs bill and two from the operating plan or the IT plan. So compared us to 12 towns, we were like the bottom of 12 towns related to IT staffing. And I say the bottom, but it's not even, wasn't even like, so just it, was like <coughs> it was the one percentile we were in. So you're gonna have two IT people over there. Well, one's a real data access person, so we're converting over to, uh, what was it called? <coughs> Aspen. Aspen data for the students to keep track of them. All this new reporting that we have to do to the state. Right and now tracks the student all the way through at the high school. You have Redeker, which we have to transfer one school to the next. It's all manual process. So it's kind of the, the state of the art. It was, it, that was the override ask. That was the, one of the main things we asked for, that we had needed to upgrade the student, what's it called? Student, <coughs> student information system. Right, so that was the main ask. So we need a data access person to manage that. And the other person is just? It just to help with all the technical. PCs and uh, you know a tech support person to, you know, to you know, just troubleshoot all the different PCs and technical stuff that we have across all these buildings. Right. Now, is it for they're all the schools? The, I mean, all the schools. They're rubber. recommended we hire four yeah. people. So yeah. uh, okay. we, we're, we're going to go with one to start, you know, see how that goes. Now, are they going to work hand-in-hand -hand with our IT guy here? Is that, what's the? Uh, I don't think so. I think it, 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 this is more like desktop support. So it's, uh, we'll, we'll report up to Rich Long in our, our IT department. So he'll they'll report to Rich. Right. He's still pretty close to Bill. Yeah. You know, he's part of the team. We work with him. He's he's on our committee. But, right. um, the new guy is a real fix it kind of a guy. Yeah, it's more of a desktop support, yeah. like call up PCs aren't working at you know you know at, at Cushion, but you know uh, Rich Long is over at Hadley doing something. You know what I mean? So right now we just don't have anybody. So okay. it's a big major complaint. After that, it gets into each one of the schools and the changes that we made each one of the schools. Uh, and then there's a salary and FTE page behind each one of those. Get into the, that detail if you want. Now, the electricity going down, Yes. is that just due to a, a better contract? It's really based on that, Paul. Yeah. You talk? I, it, we we, uh, we undertook uh, when uh, a couple of years back we undertook a, uh, a ballast in removal. So what we did was we went in and we changed all of our uh, lighting fixtures and the high school, uh, all the uh, elementary except for Jenkins and Gates. And we got a two-year interest-free loan. The high school just came off in uh, November, so we were finished for two years. And then the rest of the schools would be off by the, in June and July. 
So that interest-free loan that I'm paying $2,000 a month to each school goes away in um, July. So I'm able to save just that $100,000. So that's really capital. It's kind of a capital mix of your utility expense? Right. right. It was like when we were into the year. We, we, did a, we did an ESCO before an ESCO was installed in the town. So that's one of the things that they, uh, we had talked about prior to that. We got the interest-free loan. You know, it got tacked on to our electricity and the other big one on the first page is you said a couple placements a couple people graduated from this bed program so there yes two graduating people and we didn't have people come in so we were projecting we, we had been seeing a growth in the program even with the graduations but we actually uh, we, we you know we had saw two people leave but no growth in, 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 uh, in the L placements with the younger children and the other deduction is it looks like there was almost Six hundred thousand dollars in capital outlay <coughs> in tw in twelve, and that's being reduced by a hundred thousand dollar for f to five hundred. Right. And are those big projects? Is that what is that? Well, in in, tw in, th in thirteen, that's all. That's the IT the, the wire, the uh, wide area network, wide area yeah. network, uh, our new servers, all those things for this year. Next year, we have to review it. Right. So does that go through, that doesn't go through the capital planning process? No, that was, that, was part, that was part of the right. override. Part of the override. But still, doesn't it go in, so it didn't no. even go in at all? Okay. We just, just right there, like it is for seawalls and roads. Okay. The, can I just add, the savings yep. on the um, sped outplacements is pretty unpredictable. You know, we may, we may have students move into town, right. you know, the summer and the spring, and so that's the savings we have now, but that can change at any given day. And the percentage that the state chooses to. Yeah, I mean, you just look at the number. We've been at two one six seventy five one three one six one five one three. You know. Yeah. So what do, what does the state reimburse now? It's thirty something. No, it's well, there's a foundation it's budget. Right, the thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand dollars. So anything about forty thousand dollars, they're reimbursed right now. We're budgeting fiscal year thirteen, sixty five percent of that. No. So a typical two hundred thousand dollar placement would cost the town and situation system probably a hundred thousand dollars right. that's not even including transportation right so you have it in there at 65 percent right and that's what they did last year because they've talked about dropping it to 40 percent they it? did right. when they had we had the arrow money right so they it dropped it to 40 when we had the arrow money. it got reduced in, in 11 at 10 and 11 it was reduced so now it's back up now it's back up but it really drives on your current year experience it's a year lag in expenses. Right. So it's your expenses time last time. year that get reimbursed for next year. Right. So, so our expenses were higher last year that we have more reimbursement this year. Our expenses are lower this year, therefore we have you know, lower reimbursement next year. So it doesn't match up with the actual expenses you incur in the year. In the year. I got you. So you're going to get the savings this year for the two people that graduated. We're going to get hit. But next year you're not. Huh? Any questions on this page? This is the one page that we added the two FTEs on the next page. Mm -hmm. So now we have three people in our IT department. Then the high school's next. They got killed on the Capitol. Well, that was the, we put the legacy money that we got from Gates, we put it into the high school. Well, we the majority of it in the high school, about $100,000. Increasing and all the increases salaries. Everything else is salary, yeah. Now the five new teachers here, those are part of that seven. Those are five of the five of the seven were charged to the jobs grant from the high school. Now are those math and English and science teachers or are they not specifically, are they are they specialists? We yeah, we didn't really specialize in the grant, so high school. So it's just high school, it could be anyone in high school. go to Gates it's yep. absolutely flat with a two hundred thousand dollar increase in salaries yep. per step in step and they had one person that was charged with the grant job grant they all look the same 
Wait. They are all the same. Gates, I'm reading this right. Gates has an increase of a teacher. That's one from that job this grant. Jobs bill. So Not an increase of a body, just an increase of the expense. Gotcha. They were working there last year, but. Gotcha. Thanks. Most of the increases related to the furlough, well, step in the furlough. questions <clears throat> it, it's identical to the prior year so there's other than, than the pay increases so it's pretty straightforward I guess the the one thing that we know that everybody else might not know is that the school is a single line item so you're given a number and you can really spend it where you want so if you see a need in Cushing that you need somebody you can switch it with something and want it or you know whatever whatever you need to do so this is obviously the baseline but it's uh it's up to your discretion to move it where you want and yeah, that we have a lot of change we'll have a lot of changes before the school starts yeah. in september um, and over, then so. obviously we we work through the formula and you're given a number and you gotta book you gotta make it work so um it seems like you've got some some capital you know you still have four five hundred four hundred thousand dollars in capital which is good so there's flexibility yep. there and um, or adding some some positions which aren't in this budget so what does it look like in terms of numbers of students in coming years in terms of state population and so on because obviously we have a situation here that we're discussing tonight but as we make collective budgetary decisions want to make sure we don't exacerbate a problem that might be worse next year or might be better next year do you have any good rough handle on projections as to whether the populations are going to be going up in the next five years or down in the next five years or yeah I mean if you look they've been down two years in a row the income classes uh, but if you look over the last five years we're flat you know down one yeah. percent yeah but the last two kindergarten classes have been smaller yeah so it's definitely something we're looking at you know uh, I don't you know if you look at the growth South Shore is supposed to grow yeah that will we grow in situ with I don't know how much you so know it's anybody's guess right <laughs> okay and will if the economy improves will it be people feel <laughs> better about having children or I don't All right, know more amorous yeah Valentine's <laughs> <Yes. Yeah. laughs> Day was yesterday yeah. <laughs> you know, if you look uh, over the course of the number of years it's about one percent as it kind of goes it's not any massive spikes I mean, we had a few yeah yeah I saw that in the past but I was wondering yeah 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 you know so yeah uh, right, that's good We, the um, I, you know, there are two companies, MA, the MAPC that we mentioned earlier tonight, and the NASDAQ that do um, actual studies where they'll study projections, yeah, more of that, and yeah. they'll do a five-year report. And what we found is that it's so variable, and I think Tony and I have talked about this over the years, that those reports um, you know, are hard to take too, too seriously because in the end, uh, they may project 2% growth, 3% growth, but if it's not in sync with our experience, there's only so much we can do with that. So. Understood. But as when you're looking, I know you guys have started and talking about the master plan, but you should be, we should be looking at elementary schools. Looking at them. Well, if you're moving, if, if Gates going to be uh, six, seven, eight, you know, and the population is smaller into elementary schools, do you need to run three elementary schools or four elementary schools? Right. Well, that's the sort of stuff that you yeah. guys. I mean, that'd be know. the question that I'd be asking. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I mean, when we looked at it last time, we could not do it. We because you had the bottleneck, because you didn't have. We had. We didn't have too many. You didn't have any place to put them. Well, yeah, we could. We said, you know, could we close an elementary school if we move one grade to 
back up the gates. Yeah. And we just couldn't. You had to move two grades. Yeah. But, you know, three years from now, you know, if, if we have two more small class sizes, you'd have to evaluate it. Yeah. Are you considering redistricting at all this year? No? No. These decreases almost look like they're kind of taken care of after that. With the last few years, particularly last year, class size is kind of leveled off across the board. So we don't anticipate a spike anywhere this year in that regard. I think everybody's pretty equally tamed. Sure gets a garbage on your eye. The, um, the drop at Jenkins alone is 30 students, which is pretty significant for going to the fall. <clears throat> That's a whole class in the building, so. We'll talk later. Okay. Um, any questions on, on the budget? I mean, I guess it really refers to teachers and how many more teachers do you need? Yep. You know, obvi obviously the more teachers you have, the le smaller the class size is, you know. I guess the concept would be the better education you get, the better your MCAT score, you know, that whole yeah. scenario. So, um, you, know, you know, I know you got a grasp it's really, on it. Really, you know, know. It's, it's, I mean, we're just being careful, you know what I mean? We're, we're trying to figure out, we, you know, we have our, you know, we took the document we used last year and we worked with you, Tony, and we developed the sources and uses document for over four years and we're just trying to figure out. So everything we spend, it goes from, you know, something that can be cut next year to something that can't be cut next year. So we're just trying to make sure we don't get in a position where we have to cut the people, you know. Well, this, as I mentioned before, this is the easier year. You know, the next two years are, are exactly. difficult. So, right. um, you know, it seems like you've got it in the right place where you can get it. It's, they're not recurring expenses. And um, you know, you've got a, a union contract you got to figure out too and get your challenges out of you. So what's the way forward here? I know we don't want to get into because we can't because we don't have the respective information and everything, but in the next couple of weeks we got to reconcile some numbers. Yeah, I and think what's the process I that that's tomorrow gonna night we'll have the number. We'll have the exact number. Is that fair, the Tricia? The After the forecasting meeting, we're going to be able to come yeah, up I with Yeah, I don't think it's going to change much from what no. you said earlier. Yeah, There's I think a little bit of a gap, um, but So it you'll is probably nice. have you'll probably have a hundred thousand dollars of cuts that you'll have to find in this number somewhere and um, and once we all tie into that then that's that's where it'll go um, and then if if any of our projections are are lower I mean come in better than we expect you know then there'll be free cash and that would be a, a spot to do capital items you know probably at a special or, or next year so um, so that I think that's gonna be your challenge to get the numbers to tie to get to town meeting, um, to get to whatever that that number is, a, a thirty million one something. Any questions for us, Mike? Well, I just want to make a, a quick comment regarding like the number, and I mean historically, I mean the, the school committee and selectmen uh, work towards a number and, and agree upon a number, and, and, and we will again this year. Um, the I mean the number is not the number in my view historically has not been the number. The number is what the selectmen and the school committee agree is the number. And uh, we will continue to work towards that. And because uh, the last thing we want to do is come in with different numbers uh, at town meeting, which would not be a good thing, uh, and leave it up to town meeting floor. So we'll continue to work through the process. The process isn't done yet, and uh, we'll get, we're confident we'll get it done. Good. I, th I don't know. I completely understand, but um, but yeah, it's the process is just about done because the budget season ends in what 16 days. So uh, you know, we'll get there. We'll we'll do it. You know, we'll be fair and we'll do it the way the numbers show. I mean, eventually, it works out that the numbers are what the numbers are. As you know, we've said a number of times, and we'll just make sure that we've got the right numbers in the right holes and see what it is. I guess I guess the only difference, Tony, is I'm saying. School committee view the number is what the selectmen and the school committee say it is. Yes, I get. Uh, I guess. Also, town yeah. meeting says it is. Yeah, or with the for you know the forecasting committee looks at it and uses does the formula. Look, look you know what? I'll be honest with yeah. you, Mike. Well, let I, me finish I, and then I, you can. Um, you know, the forecasting committee goes through a process that it goes through every year and it comes up with what the number is, and we can always debate. 
you know, whether the process, whether the formula is right, but it is the formula we use, and and that's what dictates what the number is, unless town meeting changes it. John, everybody's working towards trying to make a budget work. Period. Town administrator is doing the same thing. She's the person that we've asked to start the whole process from working it, just like the schools from working on it. So the numbers and the numbers, whatever. That's the long and short of it. Everybody's on the same page, trying to get what's good for the town before the town uh, meeting and get a budget that can pass. So, and that includes the town administrator. I'm all set. Rick, any questions or comments or? No, I just got positively Don Rumsfeldy in there for a while. We're talking about the known unknowns and the unknown knowns and the known known knowns unknowns. So I, I, I'm with John on this one, and, and I'm with Mike. Let's just figure this out. It's good stuff. John, anything? Thanks. It was Thanks to for follow. putting it together, and we'll be in touch uh, tomorrow night. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Okay, the next uh, one we're discussing tonight is. Oh, yeah, Treasurer. Treasurer. Where is my list? 914. Mm -hmm. No, I, I guess so. Yeah, right. So, if we get our book out. Jane, how are you? Good. You guys need a minute? No. No. Nope. You want to get home? <laughs> what a rip, Jane. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I only have seven budgets to do, so I'll be quick. Why don't we start with your department, 145, the treasurer and collector. Um, you know, I think this is probably the only one where you really have to give us a little blurb on what your, you know, federal yeah, taxes. Sure. I don't know that you want to discuss that at, at length, but um, you know, tell us what your, uh, you know, a little overview of what you've done, what you want to do. If there's anything you want to talk about before we jump into the numbers. Um, sure. Uh, the treasure collector's office does um, a multitude of functions for the town, uh, for municipal finance. As um, most taxpayers know, we collect taxes, um, millions of dollars in taxes, excise tax, real estate tax, but we also collect water and sewer, uh, septage, um, police details, school details, fire details. Um, we also do all the benefits for all the town employees in every single department, which is um, a full-time job in and of itself. And um, my assistant, Julie Kelly, who I'm sure is watching at home right now on TV, um, she does a fabulous job of, of coordinating all that. Um, and um, we do payroll um, for the town departments as a treasurer. I am responsible for all the payroll for the town, so it's a very, very busy office year-round. So there's um, just lesser volume collection periods. Another Right now, we're in a very high collection period. We just mailed out 16,000 um, motor vehicle excise bills, so um, on top of third quarter real estate tax collections that we just did. So uh, we're very busy. We continue to be busy with more online payments and, and um, trying to take the um, uh, some of the manual processing from some of the departments, but it does increase some of the work in my office managing all the different sources of money. So that's it. Great. And you do a fine job at it. Thank um, you. We jump right to the numbers. Your budget uh, appropriated last year was $262,000. This year it is uh, $288,000. Um, were there any new positions or any new hours in those entities or is it the same people same hours uh, same people same hours um, as you know there was an increase to my salary um, and then um, there was some additions for the longevity um, I met my five-year mark as did one of my other staff so there were two additional people that will, um, out of the five of us four of us now get longevity there's one person that doesn't quite qualify and then the only other department that shows an increase or line item is postage. Postage is um, 
always a challenge. Um, we mail out, um, that's something else that we do, is uh, we send out all the vendor checks for the town every week. It's a couple of hundred checks every single week, in addition to the mailing of all my tax bills and um, that includes demand bills and such, so that adds up during the year. As all of you probably know, there was an increase to 45 cents, which to the normal household is nothing, but when you're mailing out 16,000 um, excise bills and then demands and real estate bills, um, because of the way that my software vendor does do the mailing for us, we do get discounts, but still, it's a challenge trying to stay within that budget line item every year. Any questions? No. Thank you, Jane. You're welcome. So we'll move on to the next one okay. of yours, which is um, health insurance. So down in the 900s now, 914. Um, did you want, are you going numerically? Um, I'm going by this list, oh, but oh, we can I'm go sorry. any oh, right. way okay. you want. All right. We should want to go to 158. What's the next one you have? Yeah, that's a, that's a tax title. All right, you want to do 158? I tend to organize my things numerically. It just saves us flipping the whole book. Yeah. I'm just following Kim's instruction. Okay. Um, Always good policy. As Tricia can tell you, I, every year I've been asking for more money and she's been increasing my budget every year because um, we do um, have a sizable inventory of tax title accounts. Um, that's another big challenge trying to collect on those. Unfortunately, um, a lot of people don't cooperate by making payments until they get a letter from my lawyer, um, which is very expensive. Even doing the tax taking every fall that I do, it's very costly um, for all the fees that I have to pay up front for the publication in the local newspaper um, and um, for the recording per parcel. So, um, that I had requested 50,000 and Trisha is recommending 39, which is an increase from the FY12 appropriation. Um, and just a sort of a side note is when people do pay in full that we get some of those monies back that I've paid out over the years, but it doesn't offset that line item directly. Okay, so this line is for the expense of legal fees right. and filings Right, and exactly. advertising for foreclosures. Right. And then when we do get a settlement, and we always do because we own the, the lien on the property, right. we get that money back. What portion of it don't we get back? Um, well, it's an ongoing process that I have several accounts. I can't tell you off the top of my head right now. I just put in, I think, about 90 in November to the existing inventory of, of um, tax title properties. So I pay all that money up front, but those people might not pay me two, two years, years from now, three years right. from now, five years from now. Um, so that just goes in as revenue. It doesn't, if so I have... Right, so it's a timing difference. Right. Is that going to local receipts? Is that one of the... Yeah. yeah, it's really hard to predict the election. Oh, no, it just goes into the levy and whatever year it comes in, right? So that would be the difference in in the levy if we happen to have a year when we get settlements on 54 closures. Yeah, you, I mean, it's one of those things where you have to spend money to make money, and right. Jane had a couple successful ones this year, but in terms of a predictable, right. yeah, predictable source of revenue, um, it's very difficult. No, but my question is when you do get that money in, do we have a separate line item for it in local receipts, or is it just lumped into the levy? Fees. Goes into the, does it yep. go into the uh, general fund? or, do, or General fund, yes. Into general fund. It's all right. general yeah. fund, yeah. But no, there's a line item in the, um, it's not fees and permits, something else. I forget off the top of my so head. So one of the 15 fees. local receipts, yeah. it's one of yeah. those. Right. And I did, just in case you might ask me a question, um, so far in FY12, um, my office has collected um, $24,508.69 in fees on tax title accounts. Good job. Um, just another question, how many are out there? Um, off the top of my head, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I just put, I think it was 91 in, um, on November 10th. So 91 parcels. 91 parcels in so tax title. So is there title. 200 total or? Um, 500? Probably, not 500. Um, couple hundred? Couple hundred. Um, it's ever-changing. Um, actually, Julia and I were commenting that we've 
had quite a few that have been redeeming um, recently. Some of them are smaller balances. Um, my tax title attorneys are going after some of the other ones, um, as we always do, foreclosing on some, um, trying to avoid that by getting people to pay, um, because that's always our goal is to get the money, not to foreclose. Right. Any questions? No. Nope. So um, I thought last year was 32000 This year, uh, 39000 is in the right. budget. Yeah. So now we'll go. The next one I have is 720 the debt budget. I'll tell you what, let's do that one last. Okay, that's gonna yes. Be the, the other ones are kind of one-liners. So why don't we do 910? Okay. 910 um, is Hold very. Hold on. Okay. It's very next one. Okay. Thank you. That's the non-contributory pension budget. Um, those uh, we are down to only three um, participants in that right now. This goes back to several years ago before the Plymouth County Retirement System was created, oh, yeah, no. and these people there was uh, an arrangement made many years ago. So I think when I came here uh, in 2006, we had seven or eight, and we're down to three. Um, they are um, probably in their 90s or 80s, so we've lost a couple of them over the past year. Do, do they get interest? In other words, does their pen I'm looking at their monthly amount, and I'm like, is it, does it, it's not like a, f a fixed amount. I assume it's accruing interest, so each year it will go up a little bit for them? Or? It was set back in the day, but every year they get on the base of, and I, I'm sure I have it in my notes, the base for Kohler um, increased from 12000 to 13000 for FY13. So um, they don't get very many, uh, I mean, very much in their pensions. No, that's, that's um, why I was curious. The I annual one, I can tell you, um, one of them is um, 14925 then there's one that gets 226 and then 254 so they get a small increase, three hundred ninety dollars increase annually. So, it's not so just for understanding, it's these are people that worked for the town many, many years ago before we had the Plymouth County retirement system, and this is their retirement system. Exactly. And there's three people in it. Right. Any questions? No. 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 Okay. So we'll move on to the next one, which is nine eleven. Nine eleven, 9 11 which is slightly larger than <laughs> the one that we just discussed. This right. is everybody else. Um, yes, um, except for teachers, of course. It's, it's just the um, uh, Plymouth County, um, the, those that contribute to the Plymouth County retirement system. We did have an increase this year. Last year, we actually had a decrease um, for FY12, but we funded it, uh, level funded it with FY11, and we were able to put um, fourteen thousand nine hundred eighty-three dollars into the OPEB account, the other post-employment benefits, to start funding that. Um, that trust fund was created at town meeting, and we did that last year. Um, this year, um, Trisha attended the um, Plymouth County Retirement meeting with me. Um, I'm the voting member as the treasurer for that group, and it was voted by the entire group to give, um, not unanimous. Um, but um, to give an increase to the retirees. So that resulted in an increase of $341,164 to our annual assessment. Um, there are two choices with Plymouth County Retirement. You can do a semi-annual payment, or you can do a one-time payment in July, which I've done since I've come here. I, I'm not sure if they did it prior to me. I think they may have, but um, we saved, I think, about $69,000 by doing it but it's a sizable payment at over $3 million. Well, we're doing something right if we can, if we can afford to pay it, so good job yep. on that. Um, again, this is everybody else that's in the retirement system, not the teachers, right. but there are people that are in it that work for the schools, right. like everybody the bus else. drivers, the clerical staff, clerical staff the, the administration, all that sort cafeteria. of stuff. The teachers have their own union, right. which they produce. Yep. Um, any questions on? Yeah, Tony, I just think it would be worthwhile pointing out that this number we're talking about is $3.4 million. So when we talk about adding to that new thing we started of 14900 it's a step in the right direction. But it's a teeny little step. Well, that's for, million. that's for the $50 that's not billion dollar 
Yeah. Yeah, that's exposure on the unfunded liability, on the unfunded liability, unfunded liability right. which is like right. Two hundred million right now. I yeah. think it's what it's. And, and like there were that. discussions at the meeting that Trisha and I attended about extending the funding schedule out, but it was voted there that they would extend it only to twenty thirty, and with the increase for the um, retirees and their cola days. Right. And just to Rick's point, that is the um, second highest line item the, or department expense for the town. Yes. Um, behind. That's my point. The fire department and behind our health insurance only. Any discussion or everyone good? Uh, you know, I just want to be clear. I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm just pointing. It's. I mean. We're taking care of people, and this is what it's about. It's just it's a big number. And, yes. And so when we're talking about all these changes we're trying to do on this sort of stuff, it's going to have a large impact, hopefully. Okay. Move on to the Health next insurance. one. Health insurance 914. Um, are we doing comp? No, we already did comp. Comp we did under mine a couple of weeks ago, right. Tony. So health insurance? Uh, Correct. Um, the health insurance budget is level funded. Um, as you know, um, I've a, well, um, both Trisha and I uh, have attended a lot of meetings over the past several months with organizations that I belong to. I've attended many meetings with Trisha, uh, with the Mayflower Municipal Health Group. So um, that budget is um, equal because the, the rates uh, will not be increased for FY13 as voted by Mayflower Municipal Health Group. Um, there was a small increase to the rate saver plan, but we only have four people in those, so that was inconsequential. So. And that number is five million, oh, wait a minute, sorry. Uh, yeah, five million, five, five, five oh eight, eight, eight nine oh seven. Right. So the, the only thing I'd comment to this is we're in there's potentially some savings on this with all the GIC communicate or you know um, conversations that we're having and meetings that we're having but certainly none of that is even to the point of any sort of stability right now it's still in the, the talking stages so it wouldn't be prudent for us to change that number until we know how we're moving forward with that so that's why it's level funded in the well, sense it's level funded because the county voted to keep rates the same Right, and we wouldn't budget right. a potential savings if we don't know anything no, in terms of what it would be. That, no. yeah. Yeah. Any questions on this? Okay. So we'll move on to the next item. Taxes. Federal taxes, 916. 916. Um, that is the FICA portion um, for the federal taxes and um, what I do is I take actual um, when I'm creating the budget in late November um, they do the first week of December as you all know um, so we are not quite through the first half of the year plus um, we do the sizable lot lump sum payroll in June for the teachers to cash them out for the summer so I take um, the actuals year to date from when I'm doing it and then I project forward um, including the lump sum summer payroll for the teachers and that um, comes out to be 528,423.06 uh, which is a slight decrease from last year but um, that was the census at the time of the budget this map you know our best guess at what is it 1.45 percent or something any questions on that Okay, then we'll move on to the last one, which is debt and interest. Uh, which is the most complex budget that I do. Um, as all of you know, in addition to, um, because I have to look at the big picture for the debt budget, what I'm only presenting is um, the general fund portion, the um, tax supported and the debt exclusion portion but I also do the debt budgets for the five, ent five enterprise funds and they've already presented those figures. Um, so in this, um, the number, well, I guess we can just speak, and we've mentioned this in the past, that philosophically 
our plan is to keep the debt and interest budget at that approximate level that it's always at so that as as items drop off as a 10-year asset hits its 10th year then it gives us more money to buy something else new so that we can always keep it at that exactly. it's somewhere above two percent ish um, of our total budget um, and that's what we're doing now it's just a huge huge amortization schedule right. that's broken down by type of asset department all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. um, and the piece that goes in here in our forecasting anyways <clears throat> in our budget is just the general fund um, tax-based debt and interest so what that number that isn't that number here though right that isn't right. the two million that's nine that includes the debt exclusion I think yeah it does yes so what is the what is the just the general fund it's the 1089 it's on the bottom of that sheet and oh it says there it is. total great. tax supported great so the 1 million 089 is tax supported and then the 920 is the debt exclusion supported yeah right which is just about what it was last year and this doesn't have any bonding any estimated bonding in it for 2013 is that correct um, it has a bond as part of the plan um, and I did speak at length with my fiscal advisor when I was doing the debt budget um, but the impact is only for an interest payment under the way I do the debt budget it's the existing debt all the principal and interest for the FY 13 and then um, I have a ban a bond anticipation out now so the plan is to put that into a bond issue when that mature matures in the fall and um, that's a mix of enterprise fund and general fund items mostly capital items um, and then um, but my, my question was that's uh, that's all stuff that's already been appropriated authorized, yes. and authorized, authorized and purchased absolutely do you, do you have yes. anything in that number for stuff that we may approve at town meeting and bond no, no. so there's nothing that's not the way it works that, right so that's just the flat number of right. existing no, authorization. Right. So this so you anything authorize an FY13 doesn't show up in the debt budget till FY14. Because right. you could skip a year and then you can ban it. Right, and have it mature in FY14. Yeah. So then I could do that in the next fiscal year. Right. So this has all the bans from the prior year in it, but no projections for anything that may be passed. Okay. Right, an existing debt. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that is that one Jane will come before us to do small term ones and then you'll yes. ban, ban them later on is right. that bond them later on yeah, right. Right. Yep. Okay, yep. right. you can do right a ban for two years but then you have to roll it into permanent debt within two years so the ban you just pay interest that's right and then borrowing right. against ourselves our borrowing against our own money I think you've those said. are the interfund advanced borrowers right. which I will be coming back to you before June 30th because I have to clean those up and borrow those officially um, and then I will have them mature in the fall because the market is still um, providing very very low interest so my fiscal advisor has advised that we should take advantage of that this fall and bond it so that's the plan right now we use very conservative rates and all my estimations right. any questions on that no nope. all right is that all of them Jane yes great good job thank you thank you for thanks thank you Jane Anything Put these books away. These are seven ones. Yeah. 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 Yes. And move on to um, item number 10, which is um, discussion vote of a drain layers license okay. or a license. No, 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 no. annual The motion delay. Or no, the the, the, the bottom. Page one. To this one? At the bottom. Bottom. Oh. oh. I'll get it right. Doug, you, you thought you were going to have to wait another hour, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Do you have it, Tony? Yeah, yeah. I have it on the front page. Yeah. So, a couple annual town meeting articles we're going to discuss. Okay, the so first one Canada? is yeah. the demolition yeah. delay for uh, the historical commission. Hi, Doug. Can I ask your question? Doug. Yeah. If you guys can just introduce yourselves. Yes, I'm Doug Smith. I'm the chairman of the Situate Historical Commission. Arthur Beale, the vice chair. 
great. Before we get started, uh, Sean, do you have? I just I thought we adopted this, but when we adopted the commission, did we just stop short of adopting this piece? Is that right? That's Doug? correct, Sean. All right, yep. that's correct. So, um, thanks for putting this on the agenda, and I'll try to give you maybe a three-minute synopsis of what we're proposing, why we're proposing it. Uh, get you guys to move away from future financial forecasts to think about things old for a few minutes. Um, the Historical Commission is interested in bringing forth a demolition review bylaw. Our terminology is review, not delay, because everything that gets reviewed will not necessarily be delayed. So that's a little bit of a change in the title. But the goal is simple. Uh, it's to protect significant historical buildings in situate. Tonight I'd like to present to you the reasoning for proposing the bylaw and to get your support to put this onto the town meeting warrant. For the past four years, the Historical Commission has been working on inventorying historical buildings, areas, objects, and structures in situate. Much of this work was done uh, through information collected on the restoration of the Greenbush Rail, and then there was additional historical surveying work done by funding through CPC. The results of that effort were the survey forms, which you probably saw in your packet. To date, over 900 of these forms have been completed and are available online for people to look at. It does not represent a complete inventory of every historical building in situate, but it was definitely a very good start. The next step for us was really to determine what are the most important buildings and structures in town. And we're very fortunate because many of the most important ones are owned by the town or the Situate Historical Society. However, there are many other significant buildings that are currently left with no protections at all in Situate. They're very much part of the character of the town, and our hope is to promote the public welfare by preserving some of these historical structures. The bylaw that we are proposing is not a new concept. There are over 120 cities and towns in Massachusetts that have such a bylaw in place, including our neighbors in Marshfield, Norwell, Hingham, Hanover, and Duxbury. Many towns have had great success in preserving historical buildings by using such a bylaw. Buildings slated for demolition have been preserved, others have been moved, and yet others have been documented before they've been demolished. And the process is, um, before a historical building is demolished, a building over 100 years old, a public hearing would be held to determine the significance of the building slated for demolition and the reason for its demolition. I kind of included in your packets a flow chart, I don't know if you saw it, that kind of walks you through the process as to what the applicant's responsibilities are, what the building inspector's responsibilities are, and what the historical commission's responsibilities are. There are by dates and timelines in place to make sure that the process is not stalled in reviewing. It's important to note, as I mentioned at the beginning, that not all buildings that get reviewed would necessarily get delayed. There are often very valid reasons for a demolition. But our hope is that we could educate the building owner on the historical significance of the building, perhaps get it relocated or some other option. In the case of a very significant historical building, the preferably preserved tag would be placed on it and the demolition would be delayed for up to a period of 12 months. I'd also like to note that the building inspector has the right to issue a demolition permit for health, safety, or any other reasons that he sees fit and essentially override any aspect of this bylaw. Um, I've had conversations with the building inspector. He has seen the most recent draft. He wants to make a few tweaks to it just to make sure that it's in compliance with everything. So the draft that's in your folder, draft two, will have some additional revisions to it. Finally, there's many strategies and bylaws that we could propose as a commission to protect historical buildings. The commission feels that this is the most comprehensive, least restrictive. The reality is in that the years ahead, we're going to lose a lot of historical buildings. We're going to lose them to fires, to storm damage, and yes, demolition. And you might ask yourself, will this absolutely prevent something from historic from being demolished? And the answer is no. It's a speed bump. It slows down the process to ask the question, is something very significant, and should it be preserved? Will it protect some? Yes. 
How do we know this? We know this because of the success other towns have had with such a bylaw. And like it or not, we live in one of the oldest and most historically significant towns in the country. We cannot protect everything historic, but right now, we cannot protect anything. Your questions? I'm, I'm for it. I, I can I'm just tell you, that's it. it. I've been always looking forward to this, and I have to tell you, I mean, I've seen some uh, 17th, 18th century homes that have been torn down without an opportunity to see if we could either move them to another site or do something. And I just think given the, the age of the town, you know, um, and the buildings, there's some sig significance, or the opportunity to maybe even remove um, whether it's mantles or woodwork or things within a building that could be preserved. I just think we should. I just think it's, uh, it's a good thing for the town. I know that some people might view it as being uh, an infringement on their um, property rights, but this is only a, a, a delay, um, or as, as you put it artfully, you know, it's a, it's a review to try to at least say, hey, look, if this is significant, let's move it. So I, I see it as a good thing for the town. I know some people will probably say, well, gee, it's, it's preventing me from tearing down my building and moving forward, but um, I think that's a cost you pay with, with owning a building that could be significant, not just for today, but for the future. And I, I, you got my support. Yeah, I, I support it as well. Um, Doug just said this, but um, just to remind everybody, uh, Neil can order something taken down immediately. So if there's a flood, you know, storm comes in, whatever, safety, it's done immediately. It trumps everything. And also, you didn't give any specific examples, but been around this for a while. There are things that you know, the whole sort of goal is to sometimes just get some people to think. It might be done in very good intentions. The homeowner and the developer might not be aware that the house has any significant value. So it might give people a month or two months of saying, okay, well, maybe the commission or, or the society or something can can find someone to donate time to like if it's a small, you know, small house, pick it up and move it somewhere. The owner might not care, the, the, the developer might not care, they just want the thing gone. And it's most expeditious for them just to tear it down, but they're like, yeah, whatever, if you can get rid of it in two months, I got two months for you, three months for you. It just enables those conversations to be happening on the few cases that were actually is gonna make a difference. I'm also pleased, I believe there are other towns that have a different definition of the age. Right? Yes. And some towns, I believe, have it at 50 years. And 50 years, I think, is too young because 50 years ago, it was a house now built in the 60s, right? <laughs> There's a lot of houses in the 60s. I'm sure they're very nice homes and families all have nice, warm, fond memories about growing up there, but it's a house built in the 60s. So by putting it at 100 years, which is really what we're talking about in this town of Situate. There are a lot of these old homes that are, you know, 100, 150 years old. So I, I, I appreciate the fact that you all came up with the 100 years, not the 50 years, and not even the 75 years, because, like I said, 1960s to me don't cut it. So I, I entirely, I entirely support this. I, too, one just has to come by my house and see the house I live in. Um, I just have a question, though. I think it's a great idea. Um, along what Rick was saying, so <clears throat> if a person doesn't realize it or doesn't have the way to have it relocated and doesn't have any choice, I mean, are his hands tied? You know, if, if he so chooses, or he or she so chooses to tear down a structure. Yeah, I mean, I think every case is going to be a little bit different, and right. you kind of have to hear it. Uh, you know, as a reminder, we're appointed by you, so you essentially have control over the commission who's appointed, who's on there. I think the first step would be to get people thinking early in the process, Sean. I don't think anybody wakes up one day and says, oh, it's a nice sunny day out. You know, I think I'll tear my house down. Right. It's usually a much longer process than that. So if you get people thinking about it early, try to educate them on the significance of it. If there's not, if they still feel that they, you know, want to get rid of it, then possibly we could move it. That mm -hmm. takes a few months. It's not easy. We have some people who have expressed interest to us that they'd be willing to take some stuff. But mm -hmm. in the worst case, we'd at least get to document it, either you know through sort of doing an inventory on it, photographing it, you know, 
how it sits in that neighborhood to get an understanding of it for future generations. Mm -hmm. So those would sort of be the three steps. Um, as I said earlier, you know, there's, people are going to have very valid reasons for needing to, to do something. Again, I just hope that we can educate them if it is significantly historic. I mean, there's a lot of properties, unfortunately, that sort of suffer what I call demolition by neglect. And, mm -hmm. and they're just so tired. And maybe it, it would be great to be able to save it, but it's just not feasible in a lot of ways. So those, I think, some of the discussions that you would have to have through a hearing process. But I would hope that if somebody's considering a reconstruction or a demolition, that they would at least you know, stop and think about it. I mean, we have something like 10 buildings in situate built in the late 1600s right now. One is, one is owned by the historical society and protected, but you know, there's, I bring up the case of, uh, you know, we've had conversations with different homeowners, but houses that have been in situate for 300 years, you know, you would hate to see that get torn down in three hours without at least having a conversation or try to have an effort mm -hmm. to, to save it. There's nothing we can do right now. I mean, if somebody buys a house tomorrow, Friday walks in, pulls out a permit for demolition, that's it. There's nothing in the way of that right now, and I think you at least want to have the conversation with some folks about what to do. Yeah, I, you know, part of me says, yes, it's great, and part of me says, as John was alluding to, is, you know, people are gonna think it's an infringement on their rights to own and sell their property. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the extreme case would be you've got someone that owns an old home that's in some sort of financial distress and they want to sell their home and this will impede them from selling their home in a timely basis. Um, and that's, you know, that's the scenario where people will feel like their rights are being mm -hmm. restricted. Mm -hmm. um, so but I mean, at the same time, there's all sorts of zoning bylaws, there's all sorts of uh, health and safety, you know, issues when you go to sell your house. Uh, you know, if your septic system is in failure, is that restricting you that you have to get that replaced? I mean, you have to get it replaced before you sell it. So yeah, if it's early enough in the pro I mean, that, that so, so there's examples all the time that we have for, you know, conservation or zoning board of appeals or, uh, you know, rules and regulations that the building inspector has regarding permits and things that have to be issued. So but this might be a little bit different, but it's still in the sense of for the public welfare and benefit. And I, and I guess at that point you have to make a decision is that, the people that you appoint, that the Board of Selectmen appoint as commissioners, are reasonable and can make the best decision. Yeah, I don't, I mean, it is different in terms of, as you said, it's a, it's a 12 month speed bump where you can literally delay somebody from selling their asset because of the age of their home. And, you know, I think for the historical side of situ, it's important because of things that I didn't even think of where, where people can get in and get a mantle or get, get, you know something that's significant or study it but if I was trying to sell my house and I had to sell my house because of whatever the reason is mm -hmm. you know there's just <coughs> gonna be some handcuffs that are gonna impede them and I, I think that's gonna be a big a big opposition um, you know from from town meeting and from just people's frame of mind so how I, I Rick and I are kind of looking at each other how would that slow you down from selling your home I, and you have a historical home how I, I guess I don't it would understand limit the buyers so I, I think it would it would if someone wanted to buy that historical home right. knowing that they wanted to tear it down and knowing this bylaw existed All right. then it would restrict the pool of people from to whom you could sell or they would want to buy it and they'd say I, I want to buy it but I want to buy it in two months and you know this bylaw would stop them for 12 months from it you know maybe potentially well, selling their potentially home. potentially yeah. yeah I mean that would be the maximum but also I would hope that the hearing process would uh, give the buyer or the potential buyer a sense as to the significance of what they're trying to tear down or keep so and I'm not I mean that part of it is a no-brainer I think everybody that lives in situ it doesn't want to destroy a piece of its history mm -hmm. um, you know the problem is you're going to have a situation potentially where somebody can't wait 12 months mm -hmm. and they you know they've got to make a, a personal decision that says you know I'm sorry I'd love to restore this house but uh, I can't pay my bills I can't eat I can't do whatever um, and I need to 
you know, I can't lose this opportunity. And, and that's, that's part of, and that's part of the decision process. Yeah. I think that you would have to have it. You know, it would be a public hearing. I think. You know, any part of town government, you, you wrestle with things like this all the time. I mean, you have people appear in front of the planning board or the zoning board of appeals trying to state their case as to why they need to do something or want to do something, and it really is up to, you know, some real rational people on the other side thinking it through and trying to make the best decision possible. Yeah, and uh, I mean, that's why we're vetting this out right now. And I'm Again, I know that all four of us and Joe, who's not here, would never want to destroy any piece of the history of the town, but, you know, that's, we're trying to be play devil's advocate here, sure. too, and say, because, you know, that's what town hall will bring out of, of uh, sure. town meeting, excuse me. Sure. Um, so I don't know, how do you respond, how do you respond to that person that says, look, I, I need to do it, you're on the committee, you know, you open up your hearts and say, okay, we'll demolish this one, <laughs> you know, the time frame, you know, I can understand, like, if there was a septic thing and you had to wait three months because you can get a Title V put in and that quickly, or, you know, you had to do some conservation work or something, but that's not a 12-month, you know, that, that's enough amount of period to have something not, not happen. Well, the average house was on, I just got this information, was on the market in situate last year for 138 days. So that gives you a sense as to how long if something was trying to be sold. And my hope is that people would bring, you know, their concerns or something that might be eligible for review early in the process to say, hey, Historical Commission, what do you think? This is the house. This is the age. Uh, we don't want to keep it. We want to tear it down. Is it significant? How would you rule on it? Yeah, yeah I would think most people wouldn't think about that until the buyer said, I want to knock it down. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a buyer. They're going to pay my price. They want to knock it down. And then, you know, sure. not have thought that the six months that have gone into the selling process. I don't know. Any well, thoughts? Just one question I have, uh, thinking about this. Um, it, the inventory, do, do we have an idea of the inventory of, of the um, homes age-wise? I'll rephrase that. In other words, if we look from 1,700 homes, 1,800 homes, to 1,900 homes, yep. do we have an idea of like the numbers yep. that are affected from each So central? far that we've surveyed. Now, we haven't surveyed everything in town, but we sort of have a sense. 10 in the 1,600s. 80 in the 1700s, 400 in the 1800s. 480 houses in the 1800s? 400 even. About 100 houses in the 1800s. Now, the, the only reason why I'm saying that is hmm. what's the projected numbers as you begin to go? I know you probably don't have them, but if you go it's from like 1900 1900s. to 1910, 1910, 1920, because what I'm thinking of is that. Could you do that before? 100 year. You're going to hit, a, I don't know if the right word, you're going to hit a number where it's going to go up markedly. For all the cottages that were built from 1900 yeah. to 1940 or 1930, you're going to find that. And, and my only reason for thinking that now is um, if you're primarily dealing with, let's say, homes prior to 1900, it's going to be a, it's going to be a set number, static, you know, that it will not change because it's 10. Uh, I forgot what you said, in, uh, 80 and uh, another 400. So 400, 490 homes. It's a set number of homes that are impacted by it. But once you start going from 1900 forward, because it's a 100-year look back, right. I bet you there are like three or four, oh, well, not three, I bet you there's at least 100 homes, 150 from 1900 to 1910, because the building started to uh, increase. Do you see where I'm going yes, with this? Yes, I do. I do. Um, the, the question becomes... If you look at 1900, for example, to 1910, that would encompass, for example, all the Lawson properties. Are they significant? Yeah. You know, would, would you want to keep those? I don't know. I mean, so you could do it as a, as a set date if you wanted to and go backwards. But I think at some point, you know, 50 or 100 years from now, I guess you could always change the bylaw. But at some point, you'd want to see. Um, well, just that, to, that to things that you think are significant are probably that or you may not think are significant. I mean, that we'll when it comes up a lot as a quarter day, it's actually not that old. Yeah, it so could, yeah. I'm thinking of this being it could be a negative. Going but just to, to add on to what John was saying, yeah. if you knew that, say you drew a line at 1900, mm -hmm. you could start looking at those now to say whether they're significant or not significant and start eliminating the pool so that those people would not be encompassed in this, you know, and inform the people that do have significant yeah. homes that 
that of this bylaw and start, you know, start doing things now that may not handcuff a potential seller later? I think that's called a bylaw by list they've talked about and some towns have done that but I think what we would be risking <coughs> is that we not we have not surveyed the entire town and in order to survey the entire town tens of thousands of dollars more to do that and I fear is that if we just did it off what we've surveyed so far we've probably missed something really some his, really historic buildings so working off a list kind of um, we probably have missed some significant properties that in the end would want to be, that you'd want to save. Right, and one of the Mr. major things that you miss in that is that it's part of the evaluation that goes into it, how, how significantly it has it been altered over time. And uh, you know, it, it, how much of it is still 100 years old? Mm -hmm. If it's a very small percentage and it's a, you know, a, a mantelpiece or, or, or the first floor but not the other two floors, whatever, it, it, it will influence a decision, and I think, as Doug pointed out originally, the, our emphasis is on review, not delay. So, and the deadlines that are put in place are deadlines which uh, the commission will have to face uh, uh, in conducting the hearings and doing the survey and so forth, and saying, okay, yes, this is important, no, it's not important, and the decision is go ahead and, and demolish it. And then, and, you know, we, we can't, Anticipate what the percentage would be, but there's a high, you know, a fairly significant percentage on which we're going to say no. Go ahead, as opposed to well, this is this is significant, and this is the reason why. And and what's uh, going to influence that is 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 going to change over time because somebody may totally renovate the house rather than sell it in in as many houses or most houses have have. Uh, over a period of time, and so at what, what 100 years, what does that mean? You have to judge it on a case-by-case -case basis and on a year-by-year -year basis. What, it, what is its condition in this particular year? Well, you bring up a whole other point that, you know, this is just for demolition. You know, what about renovation. remodeling or, or renovation, you know? That's not, that's not, that's not included. It. Yeah. Right. No, I'm just saying right. that there's probably even more damage that could occur in renovation than in demolition. Well, so conceivably, yeah, you, you could, I know, in zoning, keep one wall <laughs> and then <laughs> keep the, you know, and you probably could get around that, but in any event. You uh, can't cover every situation with this. With about that. That, I mean, that's my I concern. Think I think that's the concern that's going to come up mm -hmm. from the greater population. So, any other comments, uh, questions? No. Sean, any? No. no. So, are we voting to support this at? Uh, I move to support. I'll second that. If do do we do it now? I guess you can do it now if you want. Yeah. It's one less. Yeah, <laughs> might as well. <laughs> Not one on. Discussion. So, uh, motion by Mr. Murray, second by Mr. Danahy. Um, and it, go ahead, Doug. Make one comment. Just to be clear, there's going to be some minor revisions made to what you see in your packet with the building inspector. So the final language on the bylaw just needs a little bit of tweaking. When will that be Ooh, done? Yeah. Yeah. So it needs to be done by is. next Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't, why don't we, we hold why don't conversations we conversations with them this morning? I'm gonna pull back oh. my motion. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay. So do you want to wait till you have the final Yes. Yep. It's substantially what you see. Good. Okay. One person substantial one certain. person's tweak right. might be someone else's Right. Deal break. So what I just want to be certain that it's want to make sure what yeah. yeah, so I can stand up. So we for been, a town meeting. Very, I know yeah. what I voted. Neil's been very helpful on this, and he just wants to be certain that you know we're just not conflicting anything. Right. Exactly. So right. what I'd ask is, we've read this document. Yes. If the document you give us can just show us the changes. Sure. Yes. Um, Absolutely. We'll highlight the changes, and then you can see the difference. And then Doug just email me the final thing you and Neil come up with, so I can lay it into the morning. Okay. Great. Thank you for coming Thanks in. Thanks for your time. Thanks, thank you, guys. Arthur. You. Betty, thank Betty. you. All right, so I was going to take this. But Arthur, saw those pictures of you in the Boston Globe so about a month and a half ago with the uh, okay. Turkish piece. Yeah, the Turkish piece. Yeah, that's ancient history. I know, it was an old picture. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Do we have backup for the next ones? It was an email to my thing and I. Not, not tonight? No, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So that wraps up, I think, item number nine. Yes.
Drain layer renewals, Tony. They're just yep. renewals. Item number 10 is a vote uh, for drain layer license renewals. Motion. Yes. Will the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the following drain layers licenses for the year 2012? Dandel Construction, Jones Contracting, Richmond Sand and Gravel, and Jason Gary. Second. Second by Mr. Danny. Danny. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? It's unanimous. On to number 11, which is a vote discussion on a Class 2 license renewal. Sean, while you're at it. Will the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the Class 2 license for Allen H. Hopkinkin Hopkins doing business as Allen's Auto Service for the year 2012? Second. Thank you. Um, second by Mr. Danahy. Any further discussion? We got a letter from the town treasurer in here, which which I feel comfortable with. Yeah, he's, uh, he's been in business since 1969 down right. there. Somebody who's been long, hardworking, you know. Right, that's down on Blue Hill Road, right? Yep. Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Item number 12, a discussion vote to open and close the special town meeting warrant. Move the Board of Select and vote to open the special town meeting warrant for April 9th, 2012 and to close said warrant at the adjournment of this meeting. Second. Second by Mr. Murray. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It is unanimous. Um, item number 13, a report from the town administrator. Mr. Chair, I have three items, um, the first of which is um, the sub that you have on the agenda under the discussion of the Driftway Project. I provided a memo in your packet outlining the process that the board and Employed, um, relative to the issuance of the RFP for the Ocean Campus Center. And um, I just want to, for the record, um, just sort of review this since we've gotten a lot of inquiries and requests for public records to outline what the board did. And as you know, you issued, um, you directed me to write an RFP uh, for the development of a maritime and environmental studies educational institution on land proximate to the transfer station on the Driftway. This was something the board had discussed many times over the past few years, even prior to my arrival. And um, you also deliberated on what kind of safeguards for the town would be required um, if you issued an RFP and the land was not developed. The RFP was drafted and reviewed and approved by the board and town council in accordance with statutes governing the sale of public land. And it was duly advertised in the newspaper and the central register as required by law to ensure adequate public notice to any interested party. We received one response on the January 12th deadline from the Maritime and Environmental Education Alliance, Inc. And um, from there, I convened a small group consisting of the building commissioner, the DPW director, a member of the Situate Public Building Commission and a member of the Economic Development Commission to review the responsiveness of the RFP. Following that, I also conducted an additional review with Town Council. From that group meeting as well as my meeting with Town Council, I determined that the proposal we received was non-responsive. Um, when the board, when you receive a bid that's non-responsive, the board is not required to formally reject it because it doesn't even meet the threshold for consideration. You had one earlier today where we got two bids for the Widow's Walk um, food and beverage and one was only in consideration because the first one didn't meet the minimum specification. However, there has been some discussion that if the board should reconsider issuing an RFP at a later time, um, it would be good to sort of formally close the window on this process so you're free and clear to go forward on another process if you want at such time. So what I'd ask for you at this time is a motion to uh, reject the bid received from Mia uh, for the um, RFP issued by the town. And um, we can go from there. And I'm happy to answer any questions. No, I, I, um, I want to applaud you for, for going through the process. It was a lot of work to get um, where we got. We followed all the right steps. We got town council's advice every step of the way. Um, it's too bad that the project 
didn't meet the requirements and was incomplete, I think it would have been a great uh, opportunity for the town to have an educational facility that would have been completely in line with our historical um, significance. Um, at this point in time, I, I can only speak for myself, but I, I think I'd like to have the project reconsidered at some point in time. Um, uh, this process is done, though, and that's what the motion for, th for this will be. And uh, at some point in time, probably, I don't know when a reasonable <coughs> time period will be, maybe after, after the annual town meeting, um, you know, it'll probably be up for discussion again to see if this is a project that we want to pursue. Any other comments from? I uh, just want to thank Tricia. She, she, you know, we asked her to get an RFP together after the last special, and you know, you worked extremely hard to get something together. And I, I just want to commend you and, and thank you. I too. Thank you, Tricia. Very well said, Tony. It's a, uh, it's not an easy or, <laughs> or short process to to get an RFP together, or to review it and and go through all the steps. So. Uh, you know, when we do these, we do it with thought and we do it with intention. And um, um, like I said, it, it's disappointing that uh, that it didn't uh, fill all the needs. Yeah. Before I make a motion, I also just like to say um, I do think we should revisit it. This is a very important project. We had these people and come before us in open meeting for many times over the last three years, even four years, talking about the environmental education need and the marine technology need. So uh, yeah, I'm disappointed it didn't work out this time. Um, and uh, But I think, you know, after the town meeting when we have the full board as well, because this is a big subject, there's a lot of different options that we may or may not choose to go down, but I look forward to returning to that conversation. In addition to thanking Tricia, I'd also like to thank the uh, board of MIA for responding to our RFP. There are a lot of good people on and off that board various times. Ed Cavell, Jack Conway, Tom Nash, um, other people who's, who uh, have been on that board. And I'd also like to do a, a, a very strong vote of appreciation to the chairman there, Jeff Rosen, who um, I think has really put a lot of effort into this. He does a lot of good work for the town. I can think of no better citizen of this town in terms of the effort he put in for the betterment of the town on this project and many, many other things that he does. And so I think it's really good that we have people like the members of that board and other people, the many other people, particularly in the last week that have called us up to support, or called me up to support it. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point, now we're on to town meeting and many other things. Um, but. Let's revisit this at the appropriate time, find out if we want to move forward, if so, how we move forward, and if we don't, what else we might move forward with or not. So back to the drawing board in my opinion, but uh, you know, like you said, Tony and you know, all you guys, it's like, well, let's figure out what to do next. So thanks to everybody. I, I think you know we want to bring projects like this to the town. And if that wasn't able to happen, then if there's interest to see if there's a way to get it before voters at town meeting, if the board supports it, then, you know, that's what we should do. Yeah, it's definitely a town meeting issue. I mean. And that's, that's what people have to understand, that it, it was going to be decided by the town, yeah. not by the board. Right. Any, any issue of any significance in this town is going to have pros and cons to it. And that's that's what debate is for, that's what discussion is for, that's what town meeting is for to decide that. So it doesn't surprise me that people were supportive of it. It doesn't surprise me that people were not in support of it. And um, and that's where, you know, good conversation comes together and you find out what you think is, is best for the town in general. Um, and that's what town meeting is for, to vet that out. So. Motion? Yes, please. Uh, move the board select and vote to reject the re request for proposal RFP submitted by the Maritime and Environmental Education Alliance, Inc., MIA, for the development of a maritime and environmental studies educational institution on land <coughs> next to the transfer station on the driftway upon the recommendation of the review panel. Second. Second by Mr. Danahy. All in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. I have two other quick items. One, um, I had a conversation with um, the architect that's doing the study, feasibility study on Gates School. Sean, you can help me out. Um, they have um, some preliminary information available, but find that they're at a standstill right now to continue to do more work unless um, we take a pause and they get more direction from the town in terms of next steps. I think it was a 
a very um, professional and refreshing approach that the architect has come forward and said, before I go and spend a lot more of your money on stuff you may or may not want, um, I think we should see what the next direction is. And so to that end, um, what the request would be was be to have a meeting of the stakeholders, school committee, public building commission, the board advisory, to talk about the Gates building. Um, the preliminary analysis finds that the Gates, the 1930 and 1970 sections are structurally sound, but in order for the architect to move more forward, he would like more direction as to whether he should be looking at it as a school again or as a community, mixed-use community center. So given um, the board's discussion at its last meeting about moving different chess pieces on the board as far as public buildings, um, we all agree, um, and I would recommend to the board that we try to set some time uh, in March to have these stakeholders in the room so the architect can sol solicit input on what's the appropriate and most judicious use of the funds we have left in terms of a development plan for Gates. Uh, Sean, did I miss anything? Not a thing. Very well. Thank you. And we also want to make sure there's not redundancy to the RFP. Absolutely. I mean, the um, feasibility study that we're projecting right, in the capital Right, I think we plan. want to piggyback that, and if it looks clear that Gates might be moving toward one thing rather than another, then that saves a lot more um, time and energy. So I'll, I'll try to get some dates from those four groups that we mentioned and anybody else that you should be on. And if I may, someone came up to me at Village Market and said, why are we you know, doing two feasibility studies for the same thing? And I think what you just said really answers that question. The first one was of one structure. The one we talked about last week was for the whole archetype, the right. whole town. And the capital plan does not characterize those funds as a feasibility study, but really a generic description of funding allocated. So once we decide what we want to do, we can go into design, or we can go into maybe narrower feasibility for the piece we don't know. So that was written with the maximum amount of flexibility to fund right. so we can respond to what's coming out of this and the ESCO, which is happening, and Al is coming into your next meeting which is a nice segue into my third and final thing. Right. Well, one, right. one comment on that is it's important to know that there's not a company that has a bid out for $375,000 yeah. <laughs> for a feasibility study. Yeah. Those are funds that will be at ability to be used right. as we see the steps that need to be taken. Right, exactly. So maximum flexibility right now. So, um, and so then given um, that and also the fact that the warrant has to be in the hands of the newspaper March 2nd, um, I, I don't know if you can see the work ahead of you in terms of what the board has to decide and what has to be accomplished um, in little less than two weeks. And given that next week is February vacation, um, it is probably going to be virtually impossible for you to get all that done on February 28th. So, um, you know, I just throw out there, and maybe you can decide it later um, this week, is that to contemplate a March 1st meeting, perhaps. It can't be February 29th, because we're having an informational meeting for all the employees on the proposed health care changes. Um, that's 5 to 7. If you're feeling like you want a long night, however, you could come back here at 730. Um, so you're saying March 1st? I, again, there's a tremendous amount of stuff you have to vote to do yeah, I'm just now looking. and then. Is everyone available on that day? March I am. First? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So why don't we tentatively say that? I know uh, Joe will be back on the first also, so it'll be good to <laughs> welcome back. Have, uh, <laughs> I've asked Kim to keep everything off the February 28th agenda that she can, so you can just really focus on that. Right, um, February 28th. And then, you know, if you have one or two minor things, like I think we already added something for March 1st tonight, the mm -hmm. Veterans Council thing. So that's it, and obviously if we can get it done sooner, that would be terrific. Um, that depends a lot on tomorrow night, um, but we'll go forward. Okay, thank you. Um, item number 15, uh, correspondence. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just no, 14 is, calendar. you know what, 14 yeah. is other business, so you can <coughs> see if anyone has anything. Any other business? Any other business? I have, I have one quick thing. Oh. Did I just you? No, why what you were? I'm, I'm sorry, just go taking ahead. a deep breath to say. I was going to say, drive by the driftway. 
We're going to be seeing the uh, turbine up. So three pieces today. Yeah. And take a look at it. It's got going three up. Pieces today, or three pieces up. Well, the stub was down. Two more went up. Yes. Okay. Very exciting to see. Which is actually is a great segue because um, when the gentleman who runs the company was here and giving us his his dog and pony show about about it going up, I, I suggested you know how close can we get another one up? <coughs> I know we've all got our hands full with this one, but I would like to just get in the back of people's minds, you know, how close we can put another one perhaps down there, maybe further down towards James Landing or, or something like that, down in that direction. Um, because that's town on land, we've done the wind studies already, and um, I know that was one of the other areas when we were trying to cite this one uh, the com company did come back and said we could put other ones down there. And there are other places in town, too. The originally, there were 11 locations identified um, as potentially suitable. One of them was um, up on Old Oak and Bucket as well, um, up, on the, um, up on the bog, the back side of the bog, because that's up high and there's, mm. and there's pretty good wind up there as well. And, um, you know, we're certainly not going to be doing this any time in the next six months, but it might be something that we should given the long gestation period on this, looking well, at what a great thing this one is already, um, might be something for us to look into. I, I mean, a lot of it's on the, what kind of bandwidth we have internally, but also yeah. to see how this first one flies. No, absolutely. Or turns. Turns. Yeah, let's, let's go with hopefully turns. it doesn't fly. <laughs> hopefully it just turns. Yeah. Anything else? No, no, I'm all set. Yeah, so uh, it'll be going up. Uh, just an email went out to uh, the town people that there's a, s a designated spot to watch it from. Don't go to where you usually drop off brush. If you go into where you drop the boats, uh, there's a little path that goes back around there where you can get a nice view of what's uh, what's going on. Um, I think it's going to happen <coughs> pretty quickly, though. I don't, you know, when I watch that video, I think he has it up in a matter of days. Oh, it all days depends. It depends the on the wind. Right. Yeah. yeah. And obviously it's a windy area, so it, that is a big factor. Um, anything else that I can think of? No, other than I think there's a basketball oh. game tomorrow night um, over at the high school. The girls are continue to be undefeated. They're 17 and 0, and uh, the boys are fighting for a playoff spot. So uh, go there Friday night and watch them continue the battle. Um, and that's it. And the hockey team's doing great as well. All set. All right. So we'll move on to number 15, which is uh, correspondence. Mr. Chair, I have one piece of correspondence I would be pleased to read. I'd be happy to listen. It is addressed to um, Chief Police Chief Brian Stewart, and it's from David Ball, who's president of the Situate Historical Society. He says, Dear Chief Stewart, in mid-October 2011, a vehicle struck and destroyed a light pole and light fixture at the parking lot at the lighthouse. The operator left the scene without notifying the police department. The next morning, we notified the Situate Police Department about the damage, and Officer Eric Steverman responded to the scene. He found some pieces of plastic from the front end of the vehicle and said he was going to try to find the operator of the vehicle. A few minutes later, he did find the operator. Because of Eric Steverman's excellent police work, the town of Situate was able to collect from the operator's insurance company. The check arrived today. Also, Lieutenant John Rooney kept us updated on the progress of the case as it went through the court. That helped us know that the case would be settled in favor of the town. Officer Steverman's and Lieutenant Rooney's efforts saved the town over $7,000. Please let them know how appreciative we are of their efforts. We also request that this letter be placed in their personnel file. And again, this is from, sincerely, David Ball, President of the Situate Historical Society. Great. Thank you, Kim, for putting that in our packet. That's always John, a did you fun get the car fixed? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like that light. I wanted to take it out. <laughs> Is there an S-H-E on that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. We're going to uh, item number 17. I haven't gotten many of these right tonight, but I think we go into executive session. Uh, 16. 16. 16. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do it in 16. Uh, number 16, um, we are going to go into executive session. We are not going to return. For the purpose of collective bargaining for the union. Uh, actually, can I just appoint an order? Didn't we say that we were going to be closing the uh, oh, special? Right. So we're going to have to. Why don't we do it, it before? Was motion to open it? Yeah. yeah. Why don't you do it now? Why don't we close it? Good catch. Yeah. Move to yeah. close. So hang on. Move to close the special town meeting. Warrant so at second. Second. the time and stuff. 935. At there, 935. There is no special town meeting warrant right now, so, but just in case. <laughs> So we have a motion to close the special town. Second. 
Second by Mr. Danny. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. And now item number 16, we're going to go into executive session for the purpose of <coughs> contract negotiations, land, and other things that may be detrimental You're to You're in the for collective bargaining. Collective bargaining, what actually. You're to do. Okay. Collective bargaining union. Just Great. Do you want me to re say that or? No, it's no, good. You're good. Okay. Aye. Yes. 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 Thank folks. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.